Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you live to episode number 39 right here on the Eastern Observer. And oh my goodness, I see someone that looks very familiar to all of us here. Uh, we'll get to his name in just a moment. But ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you live to episode number 39 right here on the Eastern Observer and I-95 Sports Network on Zingo Television Channel 198. I'm Joey Jarzinka. We'd like to welcome our co-hosts Ian Schreier and Rob DeLuca and also our special guest here for the first time in a very long time. Not a Coke man, Tyler Adele. Tyler. Not a Coke, never a Coke. Welcome back to welcome back to your old stomping grounds. How have things gone for you? Things are uh very adult world like. I don't like it. I'd yeah. rather be here. Yeah, yeah. There you go. You I'm glad I'm here. There you go. We're extremely grateful that you are here as well. Uh, guys, Ian, Rob, how how are you both? Uh, doing well, uh, Joey. Looking forward to talking uh, a couple hours here of sports, uh, especially we're going to have a couple of other special guests on tonight as well to discuss a little college hoops. So I'm looking forward to it all. It's going to be tons of fun here, ladies and gentlemen, on this Friday, October 30th, just prior to Halloween. I can't believe that Halloween's already tomorrow, and uh, it, it's it, time is flying, fellas. But as we heard in the beginning of our of our show, we heard "Dirty Little Hipster," and what that may be. That is our special uh, our special guest, and uh, the sh the uh, the artist that it is presented by is uh, Andrew Giordano and Black Cats NYC. Actually, someone very close to Tyler Adele, uh, his uncle. Uh, he came out with a new hit single, Dirty Little Hipster, and that's what you heard in the top of the show. Uh, buy it, and it's available on Listen on uh, Apple Music, Deezer, YouTube, SoundCloud, Apple, uh, Amazon Music, Google Play, Pandora, and Spotify, ladies and gentlemen. So please, for all of those that liked our open, uh, you know where to find it on those platforms, and the name of the song is Dirty Little Hipster, out now by Black Cats NYC. Um, let's get into it, fellas. Um, we've got a lot to talk about because, oh, actually just before we get into it, uh, Tyler actually has a fundraising opportunity, uh, through GoFundMe. Uh, let's give it uh, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of uh, a welcome here. I want to know, uh, what we can do to help support, uh, first responders as, uh, a lot of that has been going to that. Give us a little bit of background on that, Tyler. Yeah. So this, uh, this fundraiser is actually going to be, uh, we're going to be helping the homeless with this one. Um, so this is something my sister has done in the past. Um, normally, um, she would be donating, uh, winter clothes, blankets, uh, but with the coronavirus pandemic this year, that's not something that's very feasible. You know, you don't want to bring around germs to other people, you know, limit the spread as much as we can, <clears throat> but we wanted to do something. Um, and we came up with this great idea of, of putting together like a care package, almost uh, a bag of like, I guess the bare essentials you would call it, or some basic necessities, a couple of like snacks, some water, just to, just to help out, you know, give, give somebody a helping hand while, you know, the weather's starting to cool down. It's going to start to get really cold overnight. Uh, it's, it, it's ultimately at the end of the day, the best opportunity we could come up with, but well, I, I shouldn't say we, I should say she, she came up with, uh, but it's, so far, it's actually going extremely well. I do actually have a bag really quick that I can show you. Like I said, it's very bare, minimal stuff. There's packages of tissues in here, uh, tooth toothbrush, toothpaste, some plastic utensils. Um, with COVID going on, you know, a two pack of face masks just so everybody can stay safe. You know, socks, gloves. Um, here's the toothbrush I was telling you about. A, you know, a healthcare kit. You know, there's so much stuff in here. And we were actually able to put the bag together, including the bag, for less than fifteen dollars. And how can people? And how can people donate as well? So there's multiple ways to get in touch with us. Uh, obviously, if you want to inquire about a donation, you can reach out to myself on any of my social media: my uh, Twitter at Tyler Adele two, my Instagram at Tyler underscore Adele, or at Primetime Tyler. Uh, you can reach out to me on my personal Facebook, my email, which I'll be, you know is always provided through the Eastern Observer. There is also a GoFundMe account that I know I shared the link with you guys later. I know we're going to start blasting that out in a bit. I will blast it out myself, so always keep an eye on my social medias for that as well. There we go. Very good. All all, uh, all good things, especially now when a lot of people 
are uh, uh, they need a helping hand. So uh, I guess I was a little off when I was talking about first responders, but Tyler did uh, he did correct me, and it was all about the homeless. So very good stuff uh, to all you right. Peter, and uh, and to you yourself as well. So go fund me, please follow Tyler Adele on all social media. We'll be talking about it and uh, blasting it through. Um, on all of our social media pages here on the Asian Observer. So, guys, let's get to it. Uh, we're five minutes in already, 6.06, six minutes past the top of the hour. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, the Los Angeles Dodgers won their first World Series title in 32 years, uh, first one since 1988. And this one was really uh, all about the, the the legendary Vin Scully, who retired a year and a half or two years ago almost. And uh, he's 92 years old. And I think that that was really, really cool to see. Uh, and not only to see, but also to hear uh, the great Joe Buck as well. And I can't believe I just said great Joe Buck. But uh, again, he really is. He really is a uh, you know, a, a Hall of Fame broadcaster. He, he brought up his father, of course, Jack Buck, uh, but then also brought up, um, you, you, how can you not bring up Vin Scully when you're talking about the Los Angeles Dodgers? Um, they won game number six to one against the Tampa Bay Rays. So, and also there was a lot of controversy as well. We'll get to that in just a moment. Um, Blake Snell went five and a third innings pitched, two hits and earned run, nine Ks in 73 total pitches. Um, he was pulled by manager Kevin Cash after an Austin Barnes hit. That was only the second hit that he, that was given up by, by Snell himself. Um, and then Nick Anderson came in for the Tampa Bay Rays. He gave up a double, a game-tying wild pitch, and an RBI ground out. Now I want to get to uh, Ian Schreier first, and I want to know the biggest thing here, which is um, are analytics being um, – are they starting to take over the game? And is it hurting the game of baseball? Because really the Tampa Bay Rays should have kept in Blake Snell regardless of what anything uh, says on paper. I think Joey was a little more inexperienced, and I want to say analytics. Uh, I thought the Boston Globe had a great uh, quote uh, in their uh, article to recap Game 6 of the World Series where they said the Tampa Bay Rays are playing with pencils and cal calculators. It, it, they're not completely wrong. I mean, Kevin Cash removes Blake Snell, who's absolutely dealing. It's exactly what you wanted to see from a former AL Cy Young Award winner in a must-win game. He's constantly changing the eye level. His velocity is somewhere in the mid to high 90s. And then he pulls him because Austin Barnes, they're not the Dodgers nine hitter, gets a base hit to turn over the lineup for Mookie Betts. And Kevin Cash's quote to that is, well, we have a lot of respect for Mookie at that point. You lose and you go home at this point. So I don't know what, what was really going through his thought really the entire series. I thought in game five with Tyler Glasnow, who's really struggled the entire postseason, he really seemed to, after the first couple innings, to finally refine that form. What does Cash do? He he yanks him out with less than 100, I think even less than 90 pitches um, at that point. So I think, to get back to my initial point, I think it, a lot of it was inexperience in the manager's chair. You had a guy, a, a manager for the Dodgers and Dave Roberts, who's been there a few times, against a guy like Kevin Cash, who hadn't been there yet, at least from a, from a manager's standpoint. And I think because he was so conservative um, in the postseason, I think that worked against him a lot. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And we're going to get to Rob DeLuca in just a second. I want to say actually a quote following uh, the the World Series loss and uh, the the the, uh, the game clincher for the Dodgers and what Kevin Cash had to say after, quote, I regret the decision because it didn't work out. If we had to do it again, I would have the utmost confidence in Nick Anderson to get through that inning, end quote. So he not only messed up but he also defended the action rob deluca your thoughts on uh blake snell being pulled after 73 pitches and also something that we've brought up in previous shows as well guys is that blake snell from innings one through three has an under two or sub two era and then following innings or following the third inning from four all the way to nine this season it balloons all the way up to an eight era roughly Rob, your thoughts? Well, I mean, Joey, I guess you could uh, our, pull up our uh, one of our favorite graphics now because this is my perfect. This is the perfect segue for yeah, here we go. Go. my oh, gears personally. Here grinds Rob Deluca's gears. The, the, <laughs> thought, and the thought process of analytics and the fact that that is what won the Dodgers the World Series was an analytical mistake by Kevin <clears throat> Cash and the Tampa Bay Rays. You do not. I don't care what this. Oh no. Cry me a river, it was the third time through the lineup. 
crap means. Like, forget that. This is the World Series, your best pitcher, only giving up his second hit of the game at that point, 73 pitches, clearly dealing. The next three hitters, 0 for 6, 6 strikeouts. Tell me on what planet was that okay to make that move. And also, just personally to Kevin Cash as a Yankees fan, how'd that stable of guys who throw 98 miles an hour work out for you, buddy? Huh? <laughs> I, I see you on the losing side of this now. You have no ring. The fact that you still have a job astounds me. Because I tell you this, in the city of New York, if Aaron Boone pulled something like that, he'd be tied down to the four train subway tracks that night. Are you kidding me? How on earth is Kevin Cash still employed for pulling one of the dumbest stunts in Major League Baseball? But back to the analytics for a second. That is, to answer your question, Joey, without question, ruining the game of baseball and also ruining other sports. Yes, they are a part of the game and should be, but they are overused and being relied on far too heavily. Anyone want to want to chime in on that? Tyler, I, I want to know your your opinion on all of this because you're a baseball fan yourself. And to see analytics really starting to take over the game of baseball, especially now in the World Series, and similar to what Ian said where it was an experiment. Well, he's never been there before, yes. But also when your ace is throwing is throwing lights out, you're at nine strikeouts, and this guy can't can't really perform in the sixth inning, and he's doing great. Why don't you leave him in? So I, I, I am a fan of the analytics. Uh, I do believe they belong in the game. I believe they should be used as much as possible. However, I think that they should also be used properly. Uh, I think in a do or die uh, game six, probably not the time to really go off analytics. You, you take, you go through your roster, you go one through nine, and then your best pitcher, and that's what you're going. You know, you don't have time to play with uh, this guy hits better against lefties and this guy hits better when there's three birds on top of the flagpole. Like, the, you don't have time for things like that in a do-or-die game. Uh, the, the decision, I think we can all agree, to take Blake Snell out of the game when he was wheeling and dealing, what, I, if I'm correct, in the sixth inning, he was still only at 75 pitches. Correct. That's absurd to take him out of the game there when nowadays you know we saw multiple yankee games multiple met games where degrom cole they're all pushing 100 pitches by the time they're leaving the sixth inning and he's he's got 75 in a world series game you probably get two more innings out of him and he probably helps you force a game seven would they win a game seven i don't know but and i, and you know, I guys will never know right and i think to tyler's point I, this wasn't the first time that we saw cash do it throughout the postseason he did it in the Yankees series where he just got just a little you know where his hands just start to get a little tight and he just didn't know whether or not to pull the trigger and I think when 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 that time comes if I'm sitting in the manager's chair I think it's very hard for me to say when I have a dependable bullpen that I don't want to go to them but Tyler said it perfectly when you're in a do or die game like that analytics get thrown to the side you have a you, he's a former AL Cy Young winner he delivered on that in game six and you pulling out with 75 pitches I don't get it yeah, I, I I'd have to agree. It it really is it really is brutal. And the worst part, in my opinion, was that he then defended the decision following uh following the loss. Blake Snell said, quote, he was disappointed. Well, obviously he was disappointed. There's no doubt about it, because really, uh, you know, he could have kept on going. And we saw his facial expression when he saw Kevin Cash uh, uh trots or excuse me, trans out of the uh of the dugout. Really, really bad stuff. Um, but again, guys, now I want to look to the Dodgers side of things because the Dodgers win their first World Series title since 1988, 32 years in the making. Uh, Clayton Kershaw, one of the best pitchers of our generation, finally gets a ring. Uh, Well-deserved, and he's done really, really well. And the coolest part is, too, is that he only grew up 20 miles away from Arlington, so it was pretty cool. He had some people there watching as well, some of his uh, uh, his childhood friends. This year's uh, postseason, Clayton Kershaw, Kershaw was four and one with a 2.93 ERA, 30 and a two thirds innings pitched, 10 earned runs, 37 strikeouts, and only five walks issued. Uh, and really, throughout this whole postseason, he has been phenomenal. And we saw uh, great numbers against Milwaukee and also Tampa Bay in, uh, I believe it was game number one or game two, uh, game one, uh, where he had 13 strikeouts against Milwaukee on the 1st of October. And then on the 20th, uh, against Tampa Bay, he had eight strikeouts. He really played lights out. 
But let's not forget also, guys, the $350 million man, Mookie Betts. Um, he was really, really great too. But also Corey Seager. Uh, he was given the uh, MVP award. Uh, and I think, guys, that this is a perfect segue into uh, something that we kind of got off of uh, MajorLeagueBaseball.com. Um, and what that is is uh, Rob Manfred actually uh, issuing – Corey Seager, the MVP trophy. Tell me if there's something wrong with this video, ladies and gentlemen out there watching. You thrilled our fans throughout the postseason with a great performance. You led the Dodgers to a World Series victory, and it's my pleasure to recognize your great play with the Willie Mays Most Valuable Player Award presented by Chevrolet. <laughs> I'll play this. He's not a good public speaker, that's for sure. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, I have to ask this question now about Corey Seager. <laughs> um what in the hell was that from uh Manfred, who not only was presenting the mvp trophy to Corey seager that we said in last week's show or i had said uh, i don't want to gloat too much but last week i had said that he was really deserving of this of, of this uh mvp trophy yeah. if mm -hmm. all things were said and done and you know don't get me wrong we know about We'll, we'll we'll get to that after with um with Justin Turner. We'll get to that in a second. But Corey Seager, Mookie Betts, those two were absolutely phenomenal phenomenal in this series, Ian. Their their numbers with just two outs were phenomenal. I mean, they it seemed like when the Rays were ever going to get out of an inning, uh, when they were out in the field on defense, that it just seemed like the Dodgers just always provided the timely hit, whether it was Mookie Betts or Cody Bellinger or, or Corey Seager. I mean, Corey Seager's numbers were just – on, on, on another chart, to say the least, uh, I think even leading into the World Series, he had the best odds in Vegas of uh, actually winning the, the Willie Mays MVP award. But I just want to like look back on that video of, of, of Rob Manfred and just think to myself, did he maybe contract COVID from Justin Turner, you know, maybe before he came off the field? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure in that situation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, all, all, all joking aside, you know, to sound like that and to say this. Rob DeLuca, your thoughts on uh, on on those guys that, uh, especially Corey Seager, who oh. who was named him. Corey Seager, well deserving, you know, clutch hit, clutch hit, clutch play after clutch play, unbelievable series from both him and Mookie Betts. I knew it was going to come down to the two of them. I would have been happy with seeing either two of them win, and Corey Seager luckily came away with it. As for Rob Manfred, you're already considered widely considered the worst commissioner in the history of sports. Maybe showing up to that sauced was probably not the smartest idea. Because uh, you, you can't be that – you can't be a professional commissioner and be that nervous speaking. Something else had to have played a factor into that. And my personal theory is that he was some for somehow, some reason, shocked by 11,000 people – 11,000 people miraculously and notoriously booing him to death. Like 11,000 people booing in that stadium sounded louder than every NHL arena booing Gary Bettman for the last 10 years. It was unbelievable how loud that was. And you could see when he first started talking before the MVP, just presenting the World Series trophy, he was taken aback and shocked that he was getting booed. And I'm like, bro, how? Tyler, your thoughts on uh, on 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 uh, Corey Seager, and then of course Rob Manfred, because we have to uh, we have to speak about this. It it it's it is. I'm appalled to see this as a commissioner, where every every commissioner is supposed to have at least about that much public speaking knowledge or or uh, or experience, if you will. Corey Seager, well deserved MVP. He played out of his mind through the entire playoffs. Um, as far as Rob Manfred goes, uh, <laughs> I don't even know the speech That's a first. It, it, you know, it is, it's, I don't, you already know you're one of the most hated people, not in sports, on the planet. And you wonder why nobody takes you seriously. 
And then I, I don't know what he drank on the way out uh, to the field, <laughs> but he there's there's no words for it. That's it, it's embarrassing to himself. It's embarrassing to the to the game of baseball. I just. I'm it's more surprised that we haven't heard anything about it yet. Yeah. Tyler, I'll tell you this much. It wasn't a Coke. That's for sure. It was not, <laughs> it was not a Coke. It was not a Coke. Well, it's very funny. It's very funny because the Essential Wrestling Podcast's host, uh, Al Carl, uh, he had this to say about Rob Manfred, and he was not. He was hanging out with Joe Namath during the game. Uh, yeah. So I mean, I gotta tell you, Al, that's 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 pretty good. Ian Ian gives you a problem. Uh, let's throw it back to that Monday Night Football game. Come on. <laughs> oh my goodness. So uh, Corey Seager, as we said, he won uh, MVP honors. Uh, he batted 328, 22 for 67. He had eight home runs, and he played a big part. Uh, in the Atlanta series as well with three home runs, four RBIs in games five through seven of the NLCS uh, where he he tallied those numbers. Humongous numbers uh, and really uh, carried this team from a 3-0 deficit um, against uh, the Atlanta Braves. So really, really good stuff uh, for Corey Seager, the now first time world champion guys uh one final thing here with the los angeles dodgers and this is a big big no-no we were talking about uh where tyler was saying you know where the if you would have kept Corey, um blake snell in and could have forced a game game seven well guys game seven may not have been uh for another two to three weeks and everyone knows what that means watching this show and listening uh, that means that someone had contracted COVID-19. And uh, very funny because um, we got to see and hear uh, after the sixth inning, Dodgers third baseman Justin Turner had tested positive for COVID-19. Now, let's not forget, he played six full innings as the starting third baseman for the LA Dodgers, okay? Um, it, it's mind-boggling because don't try and tell me that someone did not know what the deal was. Um, and I'm sure that, again, there are flaws to these tests. There's, um, you know, hiccups with whatever it may be. But the worst part, in my opinion here, and I want to take this here where um, this is going to be the segment for now of what really grinds my gears. Uh, and it's really the truth because it's, you know, we see everything that um, Justin Turner had eventually come back out onto the field. Um, and that was under, uh, basically under, um, you know, under scrutiny. Why? Because he forced his way out onto the field and basically defied Major League Baseball, defied the security, defied the police that were there uh, blocking it. And to me, fellas, I think that this has to be the greatest photo of all time because these two people have to be the stupidest people on the face of the earth. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care if that's his wife. Oh, I don't care if that's his wife at all. Excuse me, my bad. Uh, I don't care if that's his wife. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that you tested positive for, for COVID. Now you're going to go kiss your wife who now has it. Okay. There's no, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. And the best part is he's kissing her without a mask, without a mask. But hold on, it gets even better, ladies and gentlemen. He is also celebrating with the commissioner's trophy in his hands, right? No gloves, nothing on, okay? Now you have the rest of the Los Angeles Dodgers organization touching that. Oh, but look, if I'm not mistaken, guys, wasn't Dave Roberts a cancer survivor years ago? Yeah. Oh, look, at this. look at this. He's sitting here. In front, or actually, excuse me, next to his manager, Dave Roberts. And next to the trophy. All of these guys behind him, in front of him, the camera crew. This guy here, all the way on the left of your screen, took off his mask. Now, I'm going to say something here that may really kind of aggravate some people out there. Justin Turner is a horrendous human being. And I don't care what any Mets fan, Dodgers fan, any fan says. He thought about himself and himself only, and he defied everything else, defied authority, defied whatever, and he was under isolation. And I don't care if you are 36 years old and you are now an unrestricted free agent. He just finished a four-year deal worth $64 million. Okay, he hit 307 during the year, 23 RBIs, great stuff. 
uh, three home runs, six RBIs, and he hit two of those home runs in the World Series, batted 320. Good for you. The one thing that I will say is that he had an option. I would have no problem, no problem at all, if he went into right field by himself. By himself. Let everyone else take the picture. Or you have him out in right field by himself. Let everyone do their thing. But you have now contracted it. You are officially ineligible to be a part of whatever is going on. Um, I actually want to start off with Tyler Adele on this because we were talking about this um, separately out off the camera. And this is actually something that I want to bring up here from Dodgers president of baseball operations, Andrew Friedman, who, by the way, was a part of the Tampa Bay organization. Quote, having a mask on and staying socially distanced, he wanted to come out and take a picture with the trophy, which I can't state strongly enough how big of a role he's played in the success of this organization, end quote. Okay, so that means Andrew Friedman is an ignoramus as well. Tyler Adele, let's go to you. And what really grinds your gears? Uh, I'm going to need some nerds for this one. Bear with me. Oh, boy. There we go. Okay. So I would have been totally okay with Justin Turner coming out on the field, doing his thing, had he never known. Obviously, it's not his fault if he doesn't get his test back in time. My big problem with this whole thing more or less is aimed towards the MLB than Justin Turner. So I get you're on a time crunch. You want to finish your season on time, but you're having you're doing a COVID test before every single game of the playoffs. Totally cool. You're doing the right thing. If the tests were not back before the beginning of the game, that game should have never started. It should have been on the delay or it should have been pushed back a day. That game should not have started until every test came back because had every test come back and we knew well beforehand that Justin Turner was going to have COVID-19, he doesn't even, he's not even in, in the arena to be an issue. But now, like you said, he's, you know, playing tonsil hockey with his wife, holding the trophy, taking pictures next to Dave Roberts, which uh, I'm not trying to single the guy out, but again, he's a cancer survivor. He's immunocompromised. Uh, it, it, it's horrendous. It, it, yeah, you're, you're a terrible person. Yeah. You, he put himself first. And you know what? The down to earth side of me would really like to sit here and say, hey, you want to celebrate with the trophy? That's cool. Why don't you wait till you're in the locker room where there's no cameras around, stupid? Right. But you weren't even smart enough to do that. You only cared about yourself. Ian Schreier, your thoughts and uh, what really grinds your gears because not only that, and this is something for those that are first time watchers, Ian Schreier is a father. So not only, not only that, Ian, you have a daughter, uh, two year old Emma, and and really it, it's it, it, it's it's disturbing to see this as a parent when you saw not only elderly people on the field, but also there were children on the field as well. And I'm not even so sure that any anyone on the show knows this. Back in March, I had COVID-19, and I and I have no problem sharing that with my audience as well. I, I mean, I had a very mild case of it, thankfully. I never had to go to the hospital, thankfully. Um, but I had it. I had it really right at the start of it when people really didn't know what it was. Uh, but for but for me, I'm going to piggyback off what Tyler Adele is saying. And and, and COVID-19 has has a real effect on me and the way people are discussing it and the way it's talked about in our society today. First off. From the league perspective, if these tests are being given before every single game, what A, when are these tests being given? And B, with all the money that's in Major League Baseball, why aren't the turnarounds on these tests when at hospitals they are turn around, turning these tests around in minutes? Are we not finding this about Justin Turner sooner? I understand he was asymptomatic, and I'm going to get back to that word in a second. But – when, this is a, just another blemish to add on to Rob Manfred's horrid career as commissioner of Major League Baseball. This isn't so much – I mean, yeah, the Dodgers deserve a lot of blame, okay? And congratulations again to the Dodgers on winning the World Series. But this is also on Major League Baseball. It's not the L.A. Dodgers that are implementing these tests. It's not the Tampa Bay Rays that's implementing these tests. It's Major League Baseball. So this all falls in some way or form under Rob Manfred's umbrella. And how about the fact that – Justin Turner wasn't taken out of the game until the seventh inning. The game shouldn't have been played. Why? And I'm going to keep harping back on this. When were these tests given? And why weren't the results gotten back sooner? Why aren't – I could care less if you're giving out these tests at 
8 o'clock in the morning, 7 o'clock in the morning. Do what you need to to ensure that the right players are on the field and no one is possibly being exposed, which means in the clubhouse, in the dugout, out on the field, you know, players high-fiving each other, whatever it may be. You're telling me for six innings, a whether or not asymptomatic, a, someone who contracted COVID is out there on the field possibly exposing it to other players, even fans on the field, because it can't you can catch it through the air. It's not it's not just a you know, it's not like the chicken pox, like you know, I scratch your back, guess what? I'm gonna end up with chicken pox. No, this is a an airborne disease. Okay. And what it comes down with, with for me is that it's just the irresponsible nature of Justin Turner. I understand you wanted to be out there. You flat out did not defied security. Security told you to stay in the clubhouse. You completely defied security. You're supposed to be setting an example for the children. We're supposed to be moving forward from COVID. We want everything to go back to normal. And all you've done is just taken us a step back. Yeah. Rob, you know, Joe, Joe, really quickly, yeah. I, I want to, hey, you know what? I'm going to let Rob go because I want to see if anybody else picks up on what I had to add that I forgot to add. DeLuca. Major League Baseball should be incredibly ashamed of themselves for allowing this to happen. The fact of the matter is that you find out the test is inconclusive in the second inning. At that point, how do you not – first of all, yeah, you need to figure out a way to get these tests done before the game even starts. Everything needs to be done first of all. So this game should have been delayed to begin with. But the moment you find that out, that also should have paused the game at that point. Doesn't even matter that it's mid game already at that point, because now that this news has become has been now known to you, which obviously means Rob Manfred, because seriously, who else is calling the Dodger dugout at this point, other than someone who's at the arena? And all of a sudden, you just and yeah, look, Justin Turner, completely selfish human being. What he did is despicable. I can't even get into how pissed off I am with him because. That could end up NSFW. We don't need that on on primetime rundown. But as Ian said, we need to be going forward from this. And this whole situation is bringing us a step back. And for the love of God, the owners need to get together and get Rob Manfred out of baseball because this is entirely his fault. And that is where I stand on this. Tyler Adele, let's get back to you. What did you pick up that maybe we did not? Oh, I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad actually that Rob didn't pick up on that. No offense. Um, so, you know, we all we all agree that the MLB has to take a serious, serious percentage of the fault for this entire thing. Hundred percent. What I think nobody picked up on, and we were just making fun of the guy. The MLB was in the building with him and did <laughs> nothing. <laughs> the MLB was in the building. Did not come out on – now, don't get me wrong. He was a stumbly mess, and he probably would have – I don't know. He probably would have done a keg stand with a trophy. But <laughs> he just, he's – he's in the building. He didn't enforce anything. He has all the authority to uh, enforce a police escort if he's going to uh, refrain or uh, be uh, – what's the word I'm looking for? Combative. It, it's uh, – you know, in the nicest way I can say it, if he was afraid of uh, an altercation happening, grow a set. Yeah. Show show us all that there's some that you you have something in your shorts because you yeah. you've shown us in the last X amount of years you have no backbone. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know it, it's it's a perfect and I would say it's a perfect segue um into into the next into the next topic, but we're actually going to skip that topic and then come back to it um because it's it, it's an absolute disgrace with Major League Baseball and you know it's very funny. Tyler knows this. Ian knows this because. Um, you know, them to have been on the show with a form with a former host of ours. And, uh, you know, basically what the, you know, what, what it came down to was, is that baseball's credibility continues to, to decline, uh, left and right. And this is something that I've continuously said also. Um, and it's really sad to say, especially when America's pastime is supposed to be America's pastime, but guess what, ladies and gentlemen, it's slowly dying, whether people like it or not, we are seeing attendance numbers decline. We are seeing little league numbers decline. Everything is slowly going away from the game of baseball. And I would not be surprised when me, Tyler, and Rob are like 80, 90 years old, that baseball has taken that, – that baseball – I'm going to say it's still going to be here, obviously, but the impact that Major League Baseball has on the country and the world today will not be 
near what it is here in 2020 or even in the Bud Selig era. It's really, really, really sad. Um, going back to Justin Turner one last time, as we did say, he's an unrestricted free agent at the age of 36. Uh, and, and, and it's, it's, it's just pathetic. And we're going to leave it, uh, off on that. Let's get into something a little bit, um, more positive. And this here is for the Mets fans out there. Ian Schreier, you are a diehard Mets fan. Halla freaking Luya. Steve Cohen is officially the CEO and chairperson chairman of the New York Mets. Clap it up to Jerry Reinsdorf, who voted no. No, I'm not going to clap it up to Jerry Reinsdorf. And oh, I need to find some tissues from the happy tears that were pouring out of my eyes today. He's got uh, the, about the announcement that, that the wrong. And I know I'm on a show with three Yankee fans, and that doesn't bother me one bit. I have no problem speaking to my feelings about uh, Steve Cohen acquiring the Mets. You also have chills too. You also have chills. You oh, felt oh my my hair my hair. I'm telling you, especially when the announcer came that maybe De Blasio was going. I mean, that's that's another discussion if we want to start talking Andy Martino. But from a general <laughs> <laughs> from a general perspective, uh, I'm actually going to quote. Uh, you spoke about our a former co-host of the show, Nick Partain. He tweeted uh, after Steve Cohen was announced as the new owner of the Mets and said they made the World Series five years ago. I don't understand the "woe is me" attitude of Mets fans. I don't expect most Yankee fans to understand it, okay? And I and I know he's a Knicks fan, so but it's not about the way that they spent. I don't want to say not about the way they spent money. It's not about their overall salary structure. It's the way they chose to allocate the funds that they spent. And, and I'm, I'm talking about the Wilpons right now. Since 2005, in theory, their only premier free agent signings. They've really had three top tier free agent signings under in the Wilpon era since 2005. Carlos Beltran, obviously that worked out pretty well. Jason Bay and Yoenis Cespedes. Now, the the latter, yeah, the the latter two of those three, I think we could certainly question. And I'm I really want to take it back to the 2010 offseason, which was the Jason Bay offseason, the season that they signed either Jason Bay or the guy that every Met fan wanted because they needed an outfielder, Matt Holliday. And what historically for the Mets. The Mets have always signed players whose primes were ending or close to ending because they could get them on more team-friendly deals. They wanted to sign guys to less years, less money. So as a result, the Mets don't get the number one coveted free agent outfielder. He go, he stays with St. Louis on a seven-year, $120 million deal. Two, what, two World Series titles later, Jason Bay, one of the worst free agent signings in Mets history, arguably, uh, four years, 66 million, never produced the numbers that we saw in Boston. Scott Boris put it perfectly. The Mets will always shop at Freds. It, it, it's a discount store. It, it's a, I mean, think about it this way. Think about the amount of money on the insurance policies that ownership saved on David Wright and Ioannis Cespedes and the fact they both didn't play for what, for upwards of three years each, the amount of money. And they, and from what, from what I've read, has told me that they retained a very, very good chunk of that money. They didn't even reinvest it into the team. Now, to Fred and Jeff, I won't, even, I won't ever give Jeff Wilpon any credit, but to Fred Wilpon's credit, okay, he that was what they were able to do. They clearly lost a lot of money in the Madoff scandal, um, even despite their short arms and deep pockets. They really did nothing wrong. I think they, they they honestly tried to put a good enough product out there on the field every single day. I just don't think they had the money to do it anymore, and they just tried to do the best they could. And I think the reason Major League Baseball kept them in there as owners is simply because of Fred Wilpon and Saul Katz's fantastic relationship with the league office that dated back to the 80s when, the, when Fred Wilpon was a minority owner of the Mets. Um when they won the World Series in 86 against the Red Sox. So I think that's A, a big reason why the, why the deal got done. And it's just a welcome sight for Mets fans to now have, A, the richest owner in baseball, a guy who looks like he's going to clean house and start fresh. He's already talking about what I love about making charitable, you know, doing a lot of charity for areas in the New York City area. Never saw the Wolpons do a lot of that. Um, I mean, granted, we saw a lot of what they did, you know, after 9-11, how the whole city came together. But – this is this is a welcome sight for Mets fans. The fact that they are now going to have proven dollars invested into the team to try and improve the team and try to finally go after what Mets fans have been dying for for 
two decades to go after premier top tier number one free agents on the market. I think that was put perfect uh, as a as a Mets fan, and and I see. Uh, two head nods and a, and a chuckle there from Tyler. And I want to get his thought on, uh, on the New York Mets and uh, the, the next chapter of the New York Mets history. So first of all, uh, just because I'm a Yankee fan doesn't mean I'm not happy for you, buddy. Uh, <laughs> I never said that. I never said so, that. Well, you know, this is the way I see it. And Joe knows and Rob, you might or may or may not know. I honestly don't know, to be honest with you. I did when the Islanders are doing well, I want the Rangers to do well too. It just keeps that New York rivalry strong and I love it. I love if the Yankees uh, are doing well you. and the if the Yankees do well, I want the Mets to do well because then when I play you four times a year, I want to have fun with it. <clears throat> I was happy for the Islanders, I'll be the first to say it. We are Rangers fan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, your opinion's really irrelevant right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no, only kidding. Um no, it, it's I like to see that a, New York is a strong uh, sports state again. You know, it, even if you go, you know, the farther up north you want to go, even Buffalo is getting stronger. It's just overall, it's becoming a very solid sports state here again. Uh, I think there's a lot of pressure coming on Steve Cohen coming in. Um, not because he has big shoes to fill, because he, he has no shoes to fill, period. Um, but... When you come into when you buy a team in the MLB or any sport and you sign off and immediately become the richest owner in that sport, there's a lot of pressure on you to do something with that money. Now, again, I'm not giving the Wilpons any credit, but for the last couple of years, they made the signings not that they wanted to make, but they had to make. You know, they had to give DeGrom his money, and he didn't even get that much money. You know, they've they've been constantly we're shopping Syndergaard. We're not shopping Syndergaard. We might trade him by the deadline. We're not going to trade him. And there's still nothing really on the horizon for him. Uh, it's At the end of the day, it's very hard to blame them for the Cespedes contract because at the time, it was a great signing. They needed it. Yes. it you know, It was a great trade. They didn't give up a ton, but and it was a great extension at the end of the season, especially when you come off a season where the guy's on the team that brings you to a World Series when you aren't supposed to make the playoffs, period. Sure. It's, it's hard to question that move. Jason Bay, a little bit before my time, but it's laughable. Um, you know, I think the, I, one of the one of the things with Steve Cohen this year is going to be very hard to judge his first year as an owner with a looking at how shallow the free agency class is for uh, this off season outside of uh, Trevor Bauer and a handful of others. Plus, a lot of you know a lot of these teams, including the Mets, recovering from the lack of income from COVID. I think next year is going to be a lot of, uh, I guess, give, give, give to get a lot in return yeah. from a marketing standpoint. Um, so it's going to be very hard to judge Steve Cohen on his first year as a as an owner. Um, I think you want to make a statement. Trevor Bauer is a free agent. Not only is Trevor Bauer a free agent, but also, guys, hometown boy. George Springer, who is from New Britain, Connecticut. Boo. And, also, and also, let's not forget, went to UConn as well and was Big East Player of the Year back in 2012. Rob DeLuca, your thoughts, um, or that, excuse me, that was before UConn left the Big East. Rob DeLuca, your thoughts on uh, on the new era for the New York Mets? I think it's uh, yeah, I'm with Tyler here. I think it's great. I mean, I I love I I want the Yankees to be challenged by the Mets here because it'll inspire them to actually do some things. The Yankees voted yes on this vote today. They they were more than happy to see Steve Cohen come in and take over. Let the Mets be competitive. You know, I want I I'm with Tyler. I really do want to see the Mets do well. I think that they have. They need just a couple more signings to get them into the playoffs and give them that competitive edge. And now with Steve Cohen in charge, they're definitely going to have the money for it. So I, I know for a fact you definitely can't judge him in his first year, as Tyler said. He pretty much said it perfectly. But you definitely can use your money here and make one big splash here in someone like Trevor Bauer, per se, or even George Springer. I'm no fan of myself. But – Nonetheless, I think we will see something interesting from Steve Cohen this first offseason. 
It'll just be a matter of when and a matter of who and a matter of how much and a matter of how will it help the Mets. We probably uh, we will see it. Yeah. I will tell you, though, Rob, I think the one player that – we haven't mentioned that is really of the biggest interest and should be the biggest interest, but I just don't know how much money, the money that he wants and how much money he's really going to get is JT Real Muto. That's the, 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 the Mets are in dire need of a catcher. Uh, I, I think you might, you might, I really don't know what prospects after Brody has basically sold the farm this last year and a half um, to really trade for. I think you might, because it doesn't seem like the Indians want to resign him. I think the, the, the Mets are going to call the Indians about Lindor. Um, I think there's definitely a possibility of that. Um, I know there's been rumors of that, but again, I don't think there's too much feet to the fire just yet because we just hit free agency. But I want to kind of touch back real quick, Joe, if you don't mind, to the point about the Subway Series. Look, I was 13 when the Mets and the Yankees played in their first Subway Series in 1997, and I really saw as a teenager and in my early 20s the, the, the real peak and rise, of, even before the 2000 World, even after the 2000 World Series, like the real peak and rise of the rivalry of the Subway Series. When Shea Stadium and the old Yankee Stadium, there was not a seat to be found at all. Yeah, It, it might as well have been a World Series game. That's how packed that, that stadium was for any Mets-Yankees game. There is no doubt in my mind, despite the fact that they might still fill on an, on an attendance figure, the Yankees – and Mets rivalry, if we want to call it that, has lost its stammer over many years now. I mean, it's been a – I mean, granted, the, the Mets have won their share of games. I feel like every year the Subway Series always finishes three and three somehow. The, the Mets always take two out of three at Yankee Stadium, and the Yankees always take two out of three at City Field somehow. But it, there's no there's no love to that rivalry anymore. And I think the way Tyler and Rob put it is to Yankee fans to see the Mets get better, to see that rivalry really rekindle would be great for New York. Yeah. And you know what? You, you, you brought up a good point too, um, where, you know, the, the rivalry, it, the, the rivalry is still there. It's not, and you know, the subway series is still there as well. And you, you know, you said it perfectly. Ian. I think where the, the love for that subway series rivalry has, has diminished a little bit because now sure. we've gotten to a whole bunch of different rivalries. We've gotten the freeway series with LA, the Dodgers and the angels. We've gotten now, uh, uh, the, Chicago. the I say the Chicago series, you know, where it's uh, and we also now, which I've heard this too, and I think that that's stupid as well, is Tampa and Miami, the Florida oh. series. <laughs> well, why that doesn't matter. So then, you know what? So then, so then it, it just it doesn't make sense anymore. Two so, franchises whose fans could not care less about I, what happens to either of those franchises I, at all. It just it doesn't it doesn't make sense. So you know that that little spark, and that also goes back, fellas, to what Tyler was saying as well, where the credibility of baseball slowly continues to drop, and that's I think also something where that spark isn't there anymore. Um, it, it might get back to where it was, especially because, and you know, again, I don't want to keep you know giving Tyler so much credit, even though it is, listen, listen, I have to give credit where credit is due. He did say earlier, we are in New York. We are in the, in the biggest market in the entire world. And especially when New York is a big, big sports city, state, town, whatever we want to call it. I think when the Mets start to do a few things, not now, and it's not going to be now because just like how we saw a few weeks ago, right? We saw Matt Niskanen retire in the NHL, okay? I think we're going to see some of that also in Major League Baseball because, uh, and especially after the whole Justin Turner thing, there are people such as Ryan Zimmerman, we're not going to go crazy with this, but such as Ryan Zimmerman that have that are immunocompromised, not only him, but also his family. We're going to see people, that includes higher-ups all the way down. Sandy Alderson, let's not forget, he had cancer. He had a few other health issues as well. We don't know where he's going to be. And now we know that Steve Cohen wanted to bring him back because he loves him. Listen, Sandy Alderson was the general manager of the Mets in 2015 when they went to the World Series. Give him a blank checkbook. He could get you back there. Took the words right out of my mouth, Joey. He could get you back there. But I really do believe now with everything going on with the, with the coronavirus and the uncertainties not only around the country but also in Major League Baseball, we definitely cannot give him – which is we cannot give him uh, any any um, discredit. We cannot uh, throw anything at him as a Mets fan. You have to give it time. Me and Tyler know this very well. When 
Lou Lamarillo was uh, was instilled as the new president and general manager of hockey operations for the New York Islanders. Well, that was under new ownership. It took time. It took a lot of time. Mets fans have to think the same exact way. I think it's going to take time because here with the Mets, he wants to, Steve Cohen, that is, wants to clean the whole house, the whole house. And that's really by rights what he should do from top to bottom. And, and, and I don't want to say the scouts because I have a good relationship with a lot of them, especially some from the Mets. But, um, you know, listen, time's up. Um, I hate to say it. It really is uh, time to replace everybody in that system. Uh, one more thing, fellas, Steve Cohen, according to Forbes, I uh, want to go back to this worth $14 billion ranked number one in terms of major league baseball owners. The number two ranked owner is Ted Lerner, owner of the Washington nationals ranked number two at $4.8 billion. Fellas, wow. <laughs> 10 million. <laughs> 10 million. <laughs> 10 billion. Yeah, yeah. Not even million, billion, billion. For, yep. Then, and as we said last time, right? What did we say? B with a B and an M with a mill. So, um, you know, that's that's what uh, that's what Forbes says. And um, well, for Joey, can I just make? I'm just going to try and make a joke. I know it's not going to sit too well with Tyler, but I'm going to say it anyway. Someone's just got to tell Lou Lamarello to go sign some free agents. That's what he's got to go. Ah, uh, yes. Listen, listen. Don't start, don't 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 start Tyler now because we have we have a short amount of time. Uh, but the next and time we got eight minutes left here. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You know what, Joe? I, I'll, I I'll tell you, can of worms. I t I'll tell you now. <laughs> so so you're prepared in seven days. I'll be back next week to deal with you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Cannot wait to see what the deal is there. Let's keep it moving, fellas. For those, as Tyler did say, he does have about eight more minutes left. We are going to be welcoming Jaden Daly, uh, the uh, writer and uh, and head editor in chief of Daily Dose of Hoops from 7 to 7.30, and then for the final half hour, we will be welcoming NCAA College Hoops Digest writer Jake Zimmer to the show as well. He will give us his thoughts on the uh, Big East Media Day that just passed just two days ago, and college basketball is coming back. We don't know when. We know it's November 25th, but we'll get to that later on. Uh, let's keep moving, fellas. Uh, Detroit hired A.J. Hinch as their next manager. Uh, we spoke earlier about the credibility we spoke about the guys going down in terms of, uh, you know, the, the 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 lack of the lack of authority, the lack of whatever. AJ Hinch gets a job in Detroit now. Um, what is this, guys? Detroit gets a good manager, or is this going to be just, uh, you know, uh, a media frenzy? <laughs> <laughs> I, I love Tyler's comedy. I really do. It's, it's, <laughs> I, look, the White Sox inquired on Hinch, too. And I know we're going to get into the White Sox in a second. But the Tigers' quote was, now that the White Sox have La Russa, uh, the White Sox did us a big favor. I think from a perspective, let's take – I mean, it's hard to take the cheating out of this conversation. It, it, it's a big part in why – it's the reason the Astros won a World Series, right? But – He's taking over a rebuilding franchise. He's doing something that he's already done before. Even who knows whether or not if the garbage cans were still existing in 2015 at that point when he took over as manager of the Astros. But but he has that experience, though, as a transitional manager. So that's going to help him with the Tigers. The Tigers are not, even though I, I read an article that says that they're, that they're there, there's no way in my, at least in this person's opinion, that they have the type of players right now that could be compared to a Springer, an Altuve, a Correa, that you could tell me that maybe when Hinch took over the Astros in 2015 that he's inheriting the same type of team with the Tigers. No. I mean, this is a team that still is, is depending on a lot of prospects to pan out, especially right now. They've only got – they have five top 100 uh, prospects in the pipeline right now. One of them – two of them are with the team, one of whom was the – Number one overall draft pick in the 2018 draft, Casey Mize, the pitcher. They're waiting um, right now. Spencer Torkelson, the number four prospect in all of baseball, he's right now down in single A ball. So I think he's definitely got a little bit longer of a way to go. But I think this is a good opportunity at redemption uh, for AJ Hinch, though. Rob Deluca, your thoughts? Well, it's interesting because yeah, as Ian said, the Tigers are not good. I mean, they're terrible. They're they're one of Major League Baseball's worst teams. They will not – this will not be the propelling factor. And if it by somehow magically is, then you know you're probably going to see another investigation 
because there's no way the Tigers can go from winning 22 games or however many games they won in this 60-game season and then translate that into a full season and win and finish above 500, let alone anything halfway decent or anything near a playoff push. This team is not there. A.J. Hinch is also a horrible, horrible human being when it comes to ethics of baseball. And, you know, playing for the love of the game and all that and sportsmanship, he doesn't follow any of that. I personally do not like this man. I can't believe he got a job so fast. If there was going to be a cheater, if there was going to be a cheater reinstated that fast, I truly thought it was going to be the Red Sox rehiring Alex Cora that fast because that – is someone that the Red Sox love, and he served his suspension, and I had a feeling he was going to be back. I'm shocked it's not done already. If it is even going to be done, I expect it to, but obviously we'll wait and see. But, yeah, overall, look, this isn't going to do anything for the Tigers, even if they sign someone. Look, to call a spade a spade, I can't, don't think I can name more than three Detroit Tigers right now. That's how bad they are. I really just can't. And yeah. That, so, yeah, I mean, look, he's a good, he is an effective manager – I guess, but it's not going to do anything. Tyler Adele, your thoughts. I'll leave you with my thoughts on this before I uh, head my separate way. Um, kind of like what Rob was saying, I don't believe this is going to be a, de- a deciding factor in the Tigers organization. Um, it's hard to judge whether or not A.J. Hinch is a good manager without cheating because you don't know when that cheating started. Um, it could have been going on for a long time before, uh, before it was, before he was caught rather. Now, uh, AJ Hinge claims when, uh, all this, uh, scandaling and investigation went down earlier this year, um, that he had no part in it. He told them to stop. He took bats to TVs. Unfortunately, you're never going to know the full story of that because some you know, players have anonymously said he did no such thing and he condoned it. Um, some players have come out and backed him. So clearly they're so clearly someone's lying. Um, unfortunately it's, it's a situation of hearsay. So you just have to assume, and I have no problem with assuming that he's a dirty cheater. Now, when you look into the prospects, Casey Mize is really the only one that's like eye popping. The Tigers are, they haven't been a free agent destination in a long time. I don't think they're going to be anytime soon. I, um, I think I'm going to give it. If something hasn't changed for them within the next four to five seasons, they have to really, really figure something out. Cause at this point it's just getting flat embarrassing. Yeah. I mean, to, to back to Rob DeLuca's point, he can't even name three guys. Uh, I can only name two that I could think of. And remember Jordan. I can name two. That's it. Jordan Zimmerman and Miguel Cabrera. That's about it. I got Miguel Cabrera and Nico Goodrum. That's who I got out of that. Wow. Wait, Jordan Zimmerman went to the Tigers? <laughs> Where have you Are been? You sure? Yeah, Jordan Zimmerman has been there, yeah. For a Are few sure? years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, signed, yeah. he signed that big, big contract with, uh, right. with Detroit. Yeah, I can only feel like Miguel Cabrera and, uh, uh, Yep, nope. I'm drawing a blank on the- <laughs> Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, but Jordan Zimmerman was signed to the to the Tigers not really too long after Scherzer was dealt out. Yes. He's yes. been there a while. Yes. Yep. yep. No, yeah. I think it was right. I think he I think he went to Detroit shortly after the 2015 season when he was like an NL Cy Young favorite. Correct. Yep. Yeah. 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 So he's been he's been gone for a while, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know where he went. I thought he was just kind of, you know. I can't believe my Yankee fans forgot all about Austin Romine. Yeah, wow. Uh, that's right. that's, that's Poor guy. Ladies and gentlemen, Tyler Adele, back from the dead. We really appreciate you coming on, and uh, and we'll hope to see you soon. And, uh, and, and uh, yeah, it, it, a ton of fun for you to come on here and giving us some good comedy this evening. It, it, Joe, it's always a pleasure to be here. New, I, I, I got some familiar faces. I've got a new face that's going to become a familiar face very soon. I'll deal with you again next week. Like I said, congratulations on your owner. You still have Bobby Benia's contract for infinity. Years. Oh, it's cool. <laughs> 
<laughs> Joe, again, right. thank you for letting me give my sisters uh, GoFundMe a shout out. Remember to just donate to the links if you can, and I will see you guys next week. All right, Absolutely, ladies and sir. gentlemen, that is Tyler Riddell. Ladies and gentlemen, that is Tyler Riddell. We are going to bring in someone that is very, very notable to us, uh, and especially some that are uh, really good in the college basketball field. And, uh, you know, I, I got to tell you, you know, this this guy, Jaden Daly, we actually have the same birthday, which has got to be the coolest thing. And not only that, when I found that out with him, August 22nd is like the greatest day ever now because I share a birthday with someone so great. And Daily, Deuce, uh, Daily Dose of Hoops, I always say Daily Deuce of Hopes. I don't know why. Daily Dose of Hoops Head, uh, editor in chief and uh, and and lead writer and the uh, founder of this website, Jaden Daly, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Jaden, how are you? And uh, to your to your right or left or wherever it is, that's Rob DeLuca. Ian Schreier is there as well. Uh, in case you don't know them, but uh, Jaden, how are you? I don't, and it's a pleasure to meet the both of you, Joe. I'm awesome, buddy. Thanks again for having me on. I hope the same for you. Yeah, there's no doubt about it, and we're really happy to have you on here because, uh, as as Rob DeLuca knows, uh, he's a diehard uh, St. John's Red Storm fan, and uh, and always goes to me with a whole bunch of questions that I'm not really the one that could answer. It's more it's more Jaden Daly that could answer that. Uh, and you you know it's really what we saw last year, and this is something that Rob DeLuca always says is that we are we are national champions just because we were the last team. Big East champions. Oh, Big, Big East, East champions. champions. Okay, all right. Well, I, I've heard you say a few times we were national champs. We could have been. I've heard yeah. some people. I've heard some people say St. John's is the reigning national champion too. So <laughs> I guess you're not that far off because they were the last team that played, right? <laughs> we were in the lead at halftime. What can we? <laughs> Crazy, crazy stuff. So uh, let's get into it. So, Jaden, we we obviously have a lot of St. John's fans on here, a lot of Seton Hall fans on here. And uh, not only does the Hall know who you are, you are a legend in the Prudential Center, but also at your alma mater at Karnaseka Arena. Um, there is so much talk, not only of, uh, you know, the, the, the uncertainty of games being played, but also uh, the really, the, 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 the ninth place coaches poll uh, ranking for St. John's um, this past week. And uh, as we know, we'll take a peek at the coaches poll in the Big East, and we obviously know that Villanova uh, ranked number one. They got nine of those votes uh, from the coaches. Creighton was uh, selected in the top by two of those coaches, and we look all the way down. Georgetown ranked number 11, but also we say number 11 because there is a brand-new team in the conference, not really a brand new team, but someone that returned home, and that is the University of Connecticut. So, really cool stuff. And Jaden Daly, I want to know your thoughts on um, on St. John's being picked ninth in the coaches' poll. Is that too low? I think it is. And you know what? I give credit to Mike Anderson and the three St. John's players that represented the team in media day: Julian Champagne, Rasheem Dunn, and Greg Williams for having a quiet confidence and really being unfazed by the fact that the team was picked third from the bottom. I personally had St. John's either six or seven, depending on where you value Xavier, it's a coin flip either way. But to rank St. John's ninth just off the influx of new talent that's sight unseen until now, I think it's an unfair barometer. I really do. You, you still have players on the roster that, you saw last year in Williams and Champagne and Dunn and Marcellus Erlington, who I think is going to have a really big year based off the Big East tournament that he had in the big game he had down the stretch against Georgetown. There are a lot of pieces in play here, and even some of the new, the new talent, the junior college players, the freshman Pasha Alexander is drawing rave reviews. I need to see what he does personally before I jump on that bandwagon, but with a roster that has the depth and the pieces that Mike Anderson has brought to St. John's, I'm not crazy about the ninth place pick, Joe. I'm really not. Yeah, it's it's just to, and to to ask even Ian and Rob, but especially Rob DeLuca, who's also who who's a St. John's fan as well. It's really crazy, Rob, to see about um, you know to see this team ranked ninth in the in the coaches poll and i know especially because we've we've spoken about it i've seen you at a couple of games before against nova um but you know to be able to see st john's with this influx of talent as jaden said um you know it, it it's very difficult to say that this team 
could be ranked ninth, especially when there's uh, you know a, a decrease in these uh, in these upperclassmen that have led the Big East, such as Miles Powell, Marcus Howard. Uh, Georgetown is going through a complete rebuild when they lost two or actually three or four of their guys uh, last year to a couple of transfers. Uh, Omir Yurtsevin, uh, he was a grad student. He really got he didn't get anything going in the game against St. John's in the Big East tournament. Uh, so to be able to see a lot of these players now really move on to the next phase of, of their life, this is now the time where St. John's could potentially pounce on that. DeLuca, I want to know your thoughts, and if you have any questions for Jaden, uh, same thing with Ian, of course. We'd love to hear those uh, those questions. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm definitely shocked. Joey, when we talked off the air, it seemed like you and I were both pretty agreeing on the fact that they'd be roughly in a 6-7 in a spot. Like, it, it just doesn't make sense that – with most of this team returning and then adding talent and all of a sudden they're getting ranked lower than last year. I don't even understand how that can make sense. This team led by my coach, Mike Anderson, they went to the conference or I'm sorry, to the quarterfinals of the big East tournament and took Creighton and took Creighton to halftime with a lead. They were playing maybe a little over their heads, and we don't know what would have happened in the second half. Momentum was certainly on their side before COVID paused everything. But, I mean, I'm just surprised to see that this team is ninth compared to someone like Butler who has dropped off. Marquette has dropped off. Even, yeah, Xavier's down a little bit. I'm I would not be surprised to see St. John's sit by it. If the season is in full, of course, and everything, I would not be surprised to see St. John's sitting right about under Seton Hall there at the, in the sixth spot. If it's just me personally. And Jaden, I guess just to get another perspective from Big East Media Day, I'm curious what you thought, what you heard from Coach Anderson or the St. John's players that kind of has you in the same thought process that it's above that they should be above ninth place and more in like a sixth spot. You know, Rob, I, I think really it's the media that made more of more of a, a story out of the ninth place pick Zach Brazilla, who does some great work for the New York post covering both of the locals on either side of the river, asked that to the players and Julian Champagne had a great response. He goes, I'm really not into the politics or the personal stuff or anything like that. Opinions are opinions. That's what it is. And I took that as, yeah, we know what people think of us, and it's going to be on us to make sure that we prove them wrong. And, you know, Seton Hall has a similar feeling. They were picked fifth because losing Miles Powell and what's getting lost in the shuffle is that Quincy McKnight and Roe Gill are also yeah. gone. Yeah. Sandro Mamutalashvili came out flat out and said, I have a feeling the coaches are going to regret this, but we'll see. And I, I think the same can be said for St. John's, too. You're going to ultimately realize you were wrong picking this team with this talent third last. Even you, though you haven't seen the newcomers, there's more than enough of a sample size, I feel, from the incumbent talent to where Butler, who loses to Mar Baldwin and didn't have a clear second piece, and Marquette, which lost... Marcus Howard, which lost Sam Hauser to transfer last season and doesn't have much in the way of talent other than Kobe McEwen and DJ Carton, the point guard from Ohio State who's eligible. Theo John is a serviceable big man. I don't buy into, into him being like a Delgado or even a Sadiq Bey from Villanova yeah. that will set box scores on fire, but the difference in talent is more than negligible. I feel. Ian Schreier, any questions for uh, for for Jaden on uh, on St. John's or Seton Hall or uh, or even the Big East in general? I think the part for me in the poll that, that that's a little bit head scratching, and I, I know they had a solid year last year. Is, is Providence at three? I mean, but what for, for in, in St. John's case, J, uh, Jaden? My my question is more in related to. Uh, you have a lot of guys now with with the, with the loss of LJ and the loss of, of Mustafa. You have a, a lot of guys coming together, and Julian had a phenomenal year last year. There's no denying that. But you have a lot of guys coming together that really haven't played together. COVID-19 has really kind of limited exactly what they can do on the court in terms of practice. So 
how much in terms of the poll and how much going looking forward to the season, how much of that is playing off the fact that LJ and Mustafa are not there anymore? I do think that had a lot to do with it, Ian. And I'm not I'm not going to sit here and lie to you about that. I do think that played a big role in everything. St. John's was hit a little harder by COVID and has to start further behind the eight ball because of Andrew Cuomo's restrictions on indoor gatherings and when schools can resume. So St. John's being in the heart of New York City was hit a little harder than maybe a Creighton or a Butler or a Xavier or one of the Midwestern schools where there wasn't as much of a COVID outbreak at the start of the offseason would have been. So, yeah, that definitely played a role. And also, the familiarity isn't what you'd expect from a three- or four-year program where you only have one year of Mike Anderson's system under your belt and there's still more to put in place. You only taught the basics. And losing two star pieces, one of whom was out for more than half the season anyway due to injury last year, it, it does handicap you. But at the same time, I do think the overall talent level on this team is strong enough to overcome that. Now I want to move over to, um, to Seton hall because Seton hall obviously has lost the aforementioned, as you brought up earlier, Romaro Gill, Quincy McKnight, um, as well as the legendary miles Powell, uh, one of the greatest players to ever suit up for the Seton hall pirates and Jaden, um, now we look at Bryce Aiken uh, heading in here now um, uh, to Kyle Molson as well from Canisius. Uh, and you um, you know him very well f- uh, through through your Mac uh, connection and being the uh, the the writer, the writer for the main writer for the Mac, really. And uh, and not only that, but also with Sandro Mamokalashvili, who was uh, testing the waters last year in the NBA draft, and how big it is for Kevin Willard that he comes back and leads this team, uh, especially now with Ek Obiagu, uh, who really now is slated to take over that five spot. Yeah, Ike Obiagu still intrigues me because he didn't do much last season. Ramar Gill's emergence really put Obiagu in the second unit. So I, I do want to see what he does there, but you're looking at a front line. that's very deep behind Mamu. Tyree Samuel is going to be much improved as a sophomore. Everyone's forgetting about Jared Roden, who I think is going to be an old big East player by the time at all was said and done in March. This is the guy that almost averaged a double double as a freshman and had a great rookie season last year. So I do think Jared Roden, Two years ago, rather, Roden will be a junior. I stand corrected. I do think Seton Hall is very deep and very talented up front. And Bryce Aiken, Kevin Willard said, is something that he hasn't had in a long time. A a scoring first point guard, maybe going back to to Isaiah Whitehead, where after him you had Kadeem Carrington, you had Madison Jones before that, who was a stopgap in between Whitehead and Carrington. And Quincy McKnight, who could score, but was more of a pass-first point guard, a combo guard that got everybody involved. Bryce Aitken can go out and get 20 points on any given night. And Willard said, can he do it? Absolutely. But he doesn't have the pressure, and he, Willard, doesn't have the pressure to where Aitken has to play like a Miles Powell and yeah. Don Superman's cape. I think that only makes Seton Hall even more talented. And you brought up to Carl Molson, who I don't think anyone has paid enough attention to. This is a former Mac Rookie of the Year and first-team all-conference player at Canisius who's going to put up 12 or 13 points per game just off sheer talent and sheer opportunity and ability. Wouldn't shock me if he did a lot more, but he doesn't have to set the world on fire, and I think that's going to make this team much more formidable. It's really amazing to say that because I remember after after uh, COVID-19 had hit and uh, and everything was done and, and people were, were – we're hoping and praying that the winter athletes would be getting an extra year of eligibility. So then they would be able to see a full season come from miles Powell, but unfortunately it didn't work. Uh, and again, as the other, the, the other two Quincy McKnight and Roe Gill, you know, to see a, another year in addition to the guys uh, that were coming in such as to call Molson. And, you know, now obviously we're seeing, uh, you know, these guys come in and especially Bryce Aiken as well from Harvard as well. 
Uh, the craziest thing too is is that also the Ivy League is is not going to be playing, and that was something else, Jaden. That uh, that uh, rep- I don't remember which reporter had asked that question, but now you look at the at the big picture here, and you say to yourself. Bryce Aiken really landed at the right place at the right time because he could have been still at at Harvard or he could have maybe transferred to another school wherever that are not then they're not going to be going to be playing this year because of lack of funds and um and and lack of testing etc. So uh talk about that and and how you know his his right place at the right time moment and uh and Kevin Willard bringing him in when obviously he wasn't all he, not only that and we we know this very well he also was not there. Um, there were a few other choices that were in front of Aiken as well. Yeah, it, it was a stroke of convenience more than anything. And for Kevin Willard, I think the relationship that he and his staff had in recruiting him initially as a freshman played a major, major factor. Aiken's an in-state talent and played at the Patrick School and was heavily recruited by Seton Hall. Would have gone into the program with Miles Powell had he signed. Instead, opting to go to Harvard and you get an Ivy League degree and you're pretty much set for life. So, yeah, it's a stroke of convenience that Aiken just happened to be there, and the Ivy League doesn't allow for fifth-year seniors. I'll that's another story for another day, and <laughs> I think it does players a disservice. But let me get off my soapbox a little bit <laughs> to have Aiken there and to have him pretty much in your backyard to fill the need that you have. It's just another example of how Seton Hall has been blessed over the years since Kevin Willard got there, and particularly the last five or six years since the Whitehead class came in with Carrington, with Desi Rodriguez, with Ish Sonogo, with with Angel Delgado. That group really changed the program around, and I do think Aiton's going to do a lot more than his numbers are going to let on. You might see 10, 11, 12 a game, but within those stats will lie the impact. I want to go to um, where Kevin Willard brought up, or actually uh, Zach Braziller brought up about the, uh, about the schedule also. And right now Marquette, we actually discussed this last week, Ian and Rob and myself, we discussed this where um, it was a big concern where you have programs that are going to be in a uh, mandatory 14 day quarantine uh, regardless of tests, uh, that's just how it has to go. And that's just from the NCAA. Uh, and we don't know, there was some talk obviously from big East commissioner Val Ackerman, uh, that it's possible where it could be moved down to 10 days, but that unfortunately didn't pan out as we saw John Rothstein, what he, what he said today. Uh, so I want to play the clip from big East media day where Kevin will, or where Zach Braziller asked Kevin Willard, about this 14 day test and his thought or the 14 day quarantine and his thought on a functional 2021 season if no rules change. It's going to be almost impossible because let's just say Wojo just did it. He had one kid test. So now he's going to quarantine for 14 days. You're going to need four days to get your team back. Um, and then you're still going to be testing. What happens now when someone else gets tested positive? Now you're down for another 14 days. Um, Right, it just doesn't make sense to me why we're if we're going to test so much, why we're not using the test to kind of move, keep moving forward. Um, every two, we're testing every two days, so we're going to know exactly when, where someone got it, when someone got it. We can isolate that person. You could pause for, you could test the next two days, and you'll know if any if he was able to spread it or if any more has it. So I think, I think moving forward, I think people really got to look at this. Um, and we got to use the fact that we're testing so much to our advantage. And I think that's the direction we have to move. Football did it. Baseball did it. Hockey did it. Um, sports are doing it right now in other leagues. I just think as for basketball, we got to be a little bit more aggressive with the fact that to use the test to our advantage. If we're going to test as much as we're testing, um, we need to use those. We need, we need to use the history of the test to kind of keep moving forward. Okay, uh, Jaden Daly, I want to ask you this because um, you you're at the Rock all the time. You you travel to hundreds of games. Um, you know, every few years, uh, you you've done Midnight Madness. You you've done uh, you know you in in March during March Madness, you've gone from the Times Union Center all the way to Madison Square Garden, and you you took a nap 
uh, and, and you've done this. So to see that, you know, to, to see a functional season, um, do you agree with Kevin Willard where, uh, you know, it's completely impossible? I wouldn't say completely impossible, but I do agree with him in that. Uh, hold on one second, Jaden. One second, Jaden. Can, can Ian and Rob, can we hear Jaden? I'm having a little hard time. He's, he's, a, he's a little soft, yeah. Yep, yep, we're having a little hard time hearing you, Jaden. Uh, let's try that one more time. You got me now? Mm, no. He's still coming in pretty low. Yeah, still coming in pretty low. I want to shift it though. While while Jaden gets that fixed up, I want to go to the SID of the of the of the room here, Ian Schreier. Do you agree? with Kevin Willard and that 14-day rule where uh, it, it, we don't know what could happen. I just think in a sport like basketball, it's so tough. And I think that if, if we're going to – I think we discussed it last week too, that the, the cost of testing and the amount that's going to need to be done to keep these guys healthy and to keep these guys from being exposed, I, I, I just think there's just so many hoops that are gonna have, we're going to have to jump through. I'm hoping – I mean, look, we're, we're hearing a lot of announcements of a lot of mini tournaments going on. We're hoping that will kind of create – that bubble-like atmosphere that will, will hopefully – but what happens when we start hitting conference play? I mean, are we going to start playing games in one arena? Uh, what's going to happen to the NCAA tournament? I mean, these are things that have to be thought up now. I mean, season's starting in a month. Uh, Jaden Daly, let's, let's, let's try you again. You guys got me now? Oh, yes, sir. Got yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, my phone's crapping out. So if, I, if you don't see me, it's because I'm speaking into my speaker. So I do agree right. with Kevin Willard in terms – in terms of the NCAA allowing college basketball to test out of the 14 the 14 day periods, if every other sport's doing it, why not let the NCAA do it too? I, I think there's really no rhyme or reason as far as each guidelines go. If you shut down, it's real. It's not just 14 days. When you talk about the restoration period to get everybody back up to speed, it's more like 19 or 20. And I had a similar conversation yesterday with Tony Bazzello, the Seton Hall women's basketball coach. And he said the same thing, that for programs, especially those that are more up-tempo and heavily reliant on a press and run attack, it's more like three weeks that you're shutting down. And that's going to kill the whole season if one person tests positive. I, I think you should take advantage of testing and use the previous tests to build upon that Hopefully that happens as we go as we go further into the year. I do think the science behind it will improve to where it can be done, maybe not as efficiently as you'd hope right away, but eventually get to a point where you're having a similar result to the four major sports that have been able to test. And aside from the Justin Turner fiasco, I don't know if you guys touched on that before I came <laughs> on, has been pretty much incident free. Yeah, we uh, yeah, we we we, all, we almost spent the whole hour discussing the LA Dodgers just by themselves. But uh, Deluca, any any final thoughts on that before we get to the next uh, to the next question? Yeah, for yeah. You? Is, uh, is Kevin Willard Kevin Willard always that well spoken? Because my God, <laughs> could he not be like I'm a St. John's fan. I friggin' love this guy. All right, he is so well spoken, and he's on the money here he is 100 percent correct because as Jaden said shutting down for two weeks is not shutting down for two weeks it's essentially more like three and essentially you're losing it you're, lo you're you could lose in, in three weeks time you could lose seven games at that point you could seven games be gone at that point and that's that can't happen that's not he is absolutely right if we don't get rid of this 14 day quarantine uh, a full season is impossible if we go off one k one test where the kid can be isolated. Obviously, look, we want no we want no cases. Obviously, it's clear and obvious, but it's just going to happen. College football just lost Trevor Lawrence for this weekend, yeah. and so it's clear even even the superstars they're going to get hit. But that doesn't. But look, they're still playing them. They're still going to play tomorrow at noon on ABC. Quick little promo for my for my job there. But they're going to be doing it with their backup quarterback. Yeah. Now Clemson's probably still going to win the game. It's just not going to be it by as many points. It'll probably be a little bit of a closer game, so to speak. So I think you you definitely have to use the testing to your advantage if you can manage to isolate the one player or the two players that do contract it, if you can get, like college football does, two or three consecutive negative tests on everybody else, keep on going. 
Yeah. It's, I, I don't know what, what's going to happen, especially as, as Kevin Willard said, Marquette is done, is done for two weeks. And it's not only the men too, it's the women as well. Uh, and we don't know, we don't know who tested positive on the women, or we, we don't know if it was two men, two women, one and one, maybe it was a staff member. We don't know. Uh, there are certain HIPAA laws that we're not, you know, we're not allowed to, uh, or they're, they're not allowed to reveal that information to us because they're all student athletes. Um, but one final question for Jaden Daly before, uh, before we wrap this up here, Jaden, uh, this is, this is a bit, this is a biggie for you. And I think that, um, really where we can't go and be a part of the crowd. Well, not the crowd, but maybe in terms of press row, I know you can, so you might be able to still do it. We'll see. Uh, the Big Ten ACC Challenge, Rutgers and Syracuse, and Jim Beheim heading to the rack. Are you going to make it down there if you can? If the media situation allows itself, that's a definitive yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been, I was at the rack six times last year, and I'll tell you, there's nothing like it. If you guys haven't been down to Piscataway, it's a great atmosphere for college basketball, especially when you get seven, 8,000 people and the place turns into a an absolutely bat you know what crazy nut house, yeah. which the Syracuse <laughs> game would have done. That that does a major disservice for Rutgers. And I think and when I spoke to Steve Peichel a couple of weeks ago, he said his biggest concern was not about how much real hype the team handles. Yes, he's worried about that, but also how the team handles playing in an empty rack where Rutgers enjoyed such a huge home court advantage last year with an 18 of 19 and beating ranked team after ranked team. I think this is a major test for Rutgers early in the year, December 8th. The Seton Hall game is still pretty much up in the air and being worked on. But yeah, if, if, if the media setup permits itself, I'll be there. Absolutely. Ian Schreier, one final question for Jaden Daly before we head over to, uh, to our good friend, Jake Zimmer. Sure. Um, I just have one final question. I definitely wanted to ask you one last question about Seton Hall. I, I, and I kind of want to kind of flip the script here as if to say that this season's going to go off without a hitch. I mean, I think everything kind of suggests that it won't. But if it, if it does and we do have a tournament, uh, I, we all feel, I think, in some way that Seton Hall has kind of built up this resume as with, with all the players that have come through that program under Kevin Willard the last six, seven years – that they could be a team that could really make a Sweet 16 Elite Eight run. They've been that talented, but it seems like it's all, they're always the team that's making that first or second round exit. Do you feel that this could be a team that could make that kind of a run? And if so, who needs to really be that be those top performers for them to make that kind of run? It depends on what kind of a draw they get. And to answer your question, Rob, the way Kevin Willard has warmed up to the media is unbelievable. When he first got there, he was the complete opposite of what he is now. And what, what Joe and I get to experience on a regular night covering Seton Hall. But I do think Seton Hall is talented. They'll win a game in the tournament. Whether or not they get out of the first weekend remains to be seen. I want to see what kind of a year Mamu has. I do think he can get close to 20 a game or be at least a 17-8-9 and eight, nine kind of guy. Jared Roden's going to have a big year. Miles Kale is key for me because there have been times through the first three years where Miles Kale has been – inconsistent. He'll show up and he'll give you big games like he did at Maryland and like he did against Kentucky at the Garden. But then there are going to be days where he goes one for five with two points and three fouls. So he's got to make sure that he's consistent. Bryce Aiken will provide a steady hand in the backcourt. I want to see what Carl Molson does right away. I'm very high on him having seen him for two years. But the key is going to be Mamu Roden and Kale, the big three. Kale in particular, if Kevin Willard gets a lot out of him, you're going to see this team make a deep run. Jaden Daly, ladies and gentlemen. Jaden, I can't thank you enough for joining us here on uh, on the Primetime Rundown, and uh, and especially because college basketball is slowly creeping up on us. I can assure you we are, we are going to love to have you back on uh, when the time comes because there is no Big East basketball without Jaden Daly. Joe, my pleasure. Thank you for all you do. Rob, Ian, nice to finally meet you guys somewhat, and I look forward to communicating with you guys a little more as the year goes on. Absolutely. Bye, bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, you. Thank, thank you so much. Really, really a pleasure. And uh, let's get let's get in the next in in our our, our next man because uh, this is the coolest thing. And you know, I have to tell I have to tell this story. And I always say this because whenever whenever Jake is on a uh, on a on a podcast or. 
uh, or anywhere with me. I always say this story to everybody. And I know I said this uh, when we did our interview together, but uh, I met Jake when we were at Bryant University. And the bottom line was, was that the marketing person next to him was the cousin of an old friend of mine here in high school. And all of a sudden, he knew people that I knew, and it was it was the weirdest thing. And I'm an SIE, and I thought that I would run into Jake maybe at the dunk. But no, I run to him at my job. It's the weirdest <laughs> thing. It really, I think, Jake, it's got to be the coolest thing because, uh, you know, again, I'm really happy to have you here. And, uh, you know, now for a proper introduction, uh, <laughs> best writer. Uh, Jake Zimmer, ladies and gentlemen. Jake, how are you? Ian Schreier, Rob DeLuca, that is Jake Zimmer. Um, really, really appreciate you have uh, coming on here, buddy. Always a pleasure, Joey. And I mean, you think of the circumstances which we met back in, I, I, that must have been February now, um, yeah. which come to think of it, that's almost eight months. That's almost, uh, that, that feels like years ago, right? Um, yeah. And, you know, turns out we strike up a conversation. We both know, uh, lo and behold, your previous guest, right? Jaden Daly, right? So uh, the connections kept going from there. Um, and, and I will never forget a big shout out to Maddie Massa over at Bryant, who said, oh, I know, I know uh, that guy's, I, I guess he had some connection of some sort back from high school, from the Long Island days. And, you know, it's, it's bottom line is it's great to be here again with you as always. Yeah, really, really fun to have. Really, really happy to have you here. And, uh, you know, you you are from the uh, New England area and you cover uh, you. Obviously, you've done work with Bryant. You've done work with Providence. And now the biggest thing here, the biggest storyline here now, we'll get into the next into the New England area. Uh, Providence coming back and uh, and really potentially being a big powerhouse in this league. But let's not forget there is a new team that has returned into the Big East, and that's the University of Connecticut. That's UConn, the UConn Huskies, led by head coach Dan Hurley. And I think the coolest thing here, fellas, is that, and for all of us here, Ian and Rob as well, uh, we are slowly going back in time, and what what old, what's old is now new again. Uh, we see that with game shows. We see that with games. We see that with television shows, whatever it is. And now we're starting to see it in the world of sports. We saw it in uh, 2010 when the Winnipeg Jets uh, revived itself. And now UConn coming back home into the Big East has got to be the coolest thing. Uh, Jake, so you you were on the call of uh, Big East Media Day, and you're very familiar with Ed Cooley. You're very familiar with uh, with UConn, or you will be now. Um, let's look at the... Uh, Say, let's, say, let's look at let's look at the first team here, uh, the preseason All Big East first team here, and uh, we know obviously Gillespie, Robinson, Earl. We, we got that, but the biggest one on here that really sparks some sort of interest is David Duke. Um, what you heard in that in that press conference uh, from David Duke? Not only he's so down to earth, it seems he's so well spoken, and uh, and and really the coolest thing too. Uh, Stands out there, and you can attest to this, uh, is that Ed Cooley said that he's one of the hardest working guys in the gym. Well, not only that, too, Joey. I think th when you see the way that Ed Cooley talks about David Duke and in relation to the plethora of talent that he's had over the years, you had guys like Rodney Bullock who went and had a, a nice beginning to his professional career. Um, the, the list goes on. I won't even go down the professional route of Ed Cooley products, if you will. But the way that he talks about David Duke is very similar, and he has acknowledged this many times, very similar to the way he talks about Chris Dunn. Yeah, Chris Dunn did not play on the ball his first two years in a Friar uniform. He was a two guard. People forget that. In his first two years at Providence, Chris Dunn was not the point guard. He was a shooting guard. And that's very much the route that they've taken with David Duke here as well. He was behind Luan Pipkins last year. Not even to say really behind, I would say, the sense of complimenting him. But this year, Ed Cooley's been very clear about what his intentions are and the leaps and bounds that David Duke's made in his game. And not only is he a gym rat, the hardest, hardest working player in the gym, but he's also made leaps and bounds in his leadership. Ed Cooley had been asking about, or rather telling us about, how important that is. And I had the opportunity to ask David too, you know, how much importance uh, or how important that is that your coach believes in you like that to carry all of those guys. And, and he said, it comes with a lot of responsibility. 
He said a lot of times people are going to be looking at him when he has a bad game, misses a few shots, seeing how he reacts. So now it's not the David Duke show anymore. It's how can David Duke be a model for those other four guys on the court? And I think that's going to be huge for a Providence team that returns most of their core, but also has a lot of new faces this year. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And we're going to get to Ian Schreier with his question in a second. But the biggest loss for Providence, Alpha Diallo last year, he didn't get to complete his senior year, which really, really stings. And not only that, too, we also know the run that Providence went on. Uh, how bad they were in the beginning of this, in the beginning of the non-conference season, and even into conference play, where when they lost to Long Beach State out in the Wooden Classic, out in uh, out in California, that basically spelled the end of the 2019-20 season. And then all of a sudden, Ed Cooley shows some magic. Uh, Ian Trier, let's hear uh, your question for Jake Zimmer. Hey, Jake, I, I just kind of want to piggyback a little bit here off of uh, what Joey was talking about with, with Providence struggles. Uh, we saw the struggles they had in the Big East in 18-19. Last year, they're obviously better. They're, they finished 19-12. and 12. I was, a, I mean, you you can agree, disagree with me here. I think I was a little surprised by where they were kind of slotted in the preseason conference poll. I thought third was a little high. What makes you believe whether or not they can live up to that prediction? I think, and there's a shot of the coaches poll there too. I think... I was a little shocked to see the coaches vote Providence as third as well. You know, I thought um, might be a little high considering, you know, the struggles of last year, the big loss of Alpha Diallo and basically four of the five starters, right? People look to Diallo and say he was the number one guy. But if you think about it, he had a lot of good talent around him. He had Lawan Pipkins, who we just talked about. Khalif Young is going to be a huge hole to fill in that lineup too. But if you take a look at the expected lineup for Providence this year, you return David Duke, A.J. Reeves is back as well, Nate Watson. Those are going to be three big role players as they were last year too. People forget, you know, they mixed in the three of those guys quite a bit. You know, A.J. Reeves would start every couple of games. He'd have a couple of games where he'd put up 24, 26 points. Um, and then Nate Watson, how about his defense? He is one of the most prominent defensive centers, I I think, in this entire league. I think he's tenacious. If you ask his teammates and Ed Cooley, they'll call him a scrappy guy in the paint, right? So I think ultimately what the coaches valued a little bit higher than I, I had expected was the defense, right? Uh, Providence, again, you look at the national rankings and defensive efficiency last year, they were one of the elite teams in not only the Big East, but the entire nation too. They really held their opponents to... Uh, to really, I, I'm trying to find the, even the right words, right? But they they slowed down their offense pretty significantly to the point where it was a defensive game. Every single time Providence took the court in the Big East and out of conference too, mostly in conference play. You saw that mainly in February, a little bit of early March. But every time that they had a great defensive game, their opponents were forced to backtrack. You saw that against Butler and Villanova, even though they lost both of those games at the dunk. They were not playing their game. They were playing the Providence Friars. They were, they were trying to beat the Providence Friars defense. So I think that, you know, we saw the coaches value that defense a little bit more this year too. Mm. Now, now let's move over to UConn. And I think because, you know, now, now Jake, now that you obviously, you, 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 you dipped your toe into the NEC where you, you're at Bryant. And you do a lot of freelance work there. You do a lot of freelance work at BC, at Boston College as well, uh, Sacred Heart as well. Uh, your coworker, your your fellow writer, uh, Dan Gardella, does a whole bunch of stuff for Sacred Heart as well. Um, you're no stranger again to the New England area. That's where you know you're you're born and raised. So now let's look into the next team uh, in UConn. Now I want to go towards some little little stirring here of the pot, if you will. We had on. Uh, Jaden Daly earlier, who covers Seton Hall like it's his, uh, you know, not only his job, but he just covers Seton Hall really, really amazingly. Um, but there was some uh, a, a couple of a couple of rumblings there from Kevin Willard where it was, uh, you know what, we'll let him, we'll let him tell you, and we'll li listen to what Adam Zagoria had to ask, and J uh, Jake knows exactly what I'm talking about. Had asked Kevin Willard, and then had asked Dan Hurley. We're gonna play them back to back. Well, it sucks for us. I mean, to be honest with you, um, I, I didn't vote for it. I, I voted against it, to be honest with you. Um, still, I'm still really not that happy about it. Um, obviously, no, 
if you don't know, no one in this league listens to me. So it's not like I'm used to getting my way anyways. But um, I think for the league in general, I think it's great. Um, it's a great program, uh, great tradition, great history. Um, I think the program where it's at now with Danny is it's definitely on the rise. They have great players. Uh, I'm a big fan of what Dan does and how he coaches and how his teams play. And I think it's only going to make this league better. I mean, obviously, we've been the best basketball league in, in the country three of the last four years. I think they just help us to continue that trend. So now, before we, before we get to Dan Hurley uh, and to the reaction from that, once uh, once uh, Zag blogs Adam Zagoria asks uh, asks the counter question uh, to 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 uh, Dan Hurley. Uh, uh, I don't know if it was Zach or maybe I think it was Adam who had asked what his thought was about UConn re-entering the league. And as you can see, Kevin Willard, he's not too happy about it. And there were also some rumblings too that there were other coaches there who were not really on board with it either. Let's not forget, the coaches do not get to vote. That has to do with the school's presidents that have to vote That's to right. get these guys in. Let's see Dan Hurley's response once, uh, once Zags asks him that question. Please. All right. Yeah. I, listen. Um, I, I don't. That. I, I don't. That logic. Uh, it doesn't make. You know. It doesn't make a. You know. A ton of sense to me. Uh, but again, I'm not the coach at, at Seton Hall. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I. I don't. I don't. Yeah. I don't. Um, <laughs> I gotta tell you, and actually, when I, when I heard that, Jake, I was I was crying because <laughs> like that, especially when not only Dan Hurley is from the New Jersey area, but also his alma mater is Seton Hall. Does this does this give you a little bit, and especially because something that Dan said, the media hyped up a little bit, and whatever, and you know there was some sarcasm from Kevin, and you know again, that's probably then that's what Dan thought as well. But now you really dive into it and you say to yourself, well, Dan is now going to be taking some potential recruits from New Jersey that Kevin Willard usually gets a part of too. And now Rutgers is getting better. So now there's now two guys in there that could be stealing some of Kevin Willard's thunder. Jake, your thoughts on uh, on what Kevin Willard said and then Dan Hurley's laughable response. Well, you just make it, you made a really good point about the recruits and the dynamic because not too long ago I came on the primetime rundown and we basically had a whole episode dedicated to what you had just talked about. Adama Sonogo is basically a lock to Seton Hall. And guess what? He's putting on the Yukon Husky uniform as soon as he's eligible, right? So that's a big already. <laughs> that may be why Kevin Willard uh, said a version of what he just did, but I, I think – Without reading too much into it, Kevin Willard knows that UConn's a threat. He, he's not a dumb guy. He's one of those very – he's a very smart uh, coach. He's very well respected. And, you know, I, I think um, without – I don't know if he meant as much uh, emotionally as he – as it appeared in the videos, of course, but – I mean, he raises a valid point. UConn is going to be a thorn in the side of a lot of these schools. Let's not forget, they have uh, – someone's going to have to fact check, but I think besides Villanova, they probably, out of the 11 schools, have a very dense NBA population. I, I'd say at least in the top half of the, the league for sure of guys that have gone pro into the NBA. So yeah. that's a league that – or that's a program, I should say, that when they're in the league – if they catch a little bit of fire, that could be a huge problem for Seton Hall down the road. And this is coming at a time where Seton Hall, you look at their success in, in the past probably 20 years, nothing crazy to write home about. It's been a league historically dominated by UConn, by Villanova in recent years for sure. With perennial entrants, they come and go, right? But UConn is, is not a program that I want to be – locked into facing twice a year for the foreseeable future. So I, I get Kevin Willard's comments, but unfortunately he can't play by those rules anymore, right? He has to, uh, he has to play nicely. He, he can't play by his own rules, I should say. He has to play by what his president signed him up for. Ian Schreier. I, I want to kind of keep things here with, uh, with UConn, Danny Hurley. And, and my question is, is I want to take it back a few years ago 
when um, Danny Hurley was at URI and and really the um, really what he did there and how he lifted URI to the heights that he did. And when he came to UConn, I felt that this was the perfect match. Um, you had a guy who knows that who knows that network, who knows that area, who knows how to recruit. And who, I mean, he's he obviously succeeded in the NEC at Wagner. He succeeded greatly at, at URI. Where it really gets me is more has to do with the fact that I thought he really had a chance in his first year. And granted, he's 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 you know taking over Kevin Ollie's team, and but I think he really had an opportunity to put his stamp on the American. Where there's a lot. I don't. I mean, aside from Cincinnati, SMU. Houston. I mean, it's not the Big East. He had his chance to really put his stamp there. He didn't do it. Do you feel that as we go forward, is Danny Hurley the right guy for UConn, or are they going to? Are we going to be looking at another coaching change in a couple of years? I think the next few years are going to be very telling, and that's a great question. And I, if I had an answer for you, I'd be making a lot more money than I am. Now, for sure. <laughs> I, you know, he's. You make some great points, and I was describing. Dan Hurley and his recruiting to uh, a couple of friends a couple of days ago. And it took me until that I sent that text to realize that the way he recruits and the way he coaches are very similar to the program that Ed Cooley runs and that he came in, uh, you know, with the experience of an NEC school and Wagner, right? Very similar to what Ed Cooley did over in the Mac at Fairfield University. He was an assistant coach at Boston College for a bit under Al Skinner. Same kind of journey with Dan Hurley. Very credible experience among a wide variety of programs. He had the show to run to himself at, you know, Wagner. And then, uh, of course, URI. I mean, my goodness, the the program that he's turned URI into, now they're perennial contenders every single year, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, beating Dayton, that's another story, right? That's, I don't really think anybody in the A-10 can do that, no matter who's coaching. But Dan Hurley is a guy that's proved that he is at least worth a shot of being at the helm of a program and turning it into his own in the Big East. And that, that I think, arguably, you can say, if he does that really well at UConn, maybe picks up a, a league championship or, or dare I speak this into existence, a national title, then you really have to start talking about where Dan Hurley ranks in position to get a Power 5 job. Um, and again, where I think we're years out from that, but I think he is more than earned his shot to see what he can do with his roster. And I mean, look at the guys on the team now. He recruited most of these guys, believe it or not. James Booknight's one of them. He just brought in Tyrese Martin. He purged him from URI. Um, Look at guys like Andre Jackson, uh, RJ Cole, people like those. Those are all Dan Hurley's doings. So we're really going to get to see what he does with his roster. I'm looking at this now, and with the potential starters this year, I mean, (sighs) probably just Josh Carlton and Tyler Pauly that he didn't recruit. So this is going to be a really telling year for Dan Hurley. I think it's going to be a very, even more uh, historically significant year for UConn than it really ever has been. So we're going to find out a lot about the Huskies. I I think that has a lot to ask. Then Uh, my last question would be, uh, we were talking with, as as you know, we were talking with Jaden Daly earlier and I kind of wanted to ask him the same question, but uh, obviously I want to ask it to you as well, Jake. Uh, There's a lot of hope, I think, building up uh, based on last season and what the talent that St. John's has around them. Based on what you've seen in the poll, is St. John's that surprise team in the Big East, or is there a team that really sits there below where you could see maybe one of those teams, maybe even like a Georgetown, like is Ewing going to finally lead them there? Like is who's the team really to watch out for this year in the Big East as a surprise? Man, that's a really, really good question. I I like the talent that St. John's is building. I think that Mike Anderson is clearly, again, talk about guys that have proven he's right for that job. A lot of questions about him when he came from Arkansas. He finally, um, you know, and and again, St. John's didn't have a great year last year, right? But Mike Anderson has been consistently talked about by Division I, II, and three coaches, and even in the NBA, saying that's the best hire that St. John's ever could have made and arguably the best coach in the entire nation. That carries some weight. I think they're a couple years out from really competing. Uh, they, You saw what they did last year. They, at the end, I mean, if they had played that first round game the entire way through, I think we would have seen Creighton get upset in the first round or uh, the second round, I should say, you know, the after the buys. But I think they're surrounding themselves with the right talent. I think uh, Greg Williams is going to have another great year. I think um, Posh Alexander has a lot of promise, right? Unfortunately, I don't. I think it's a little bit too premature to say that that's the team in the Big East to to really climb the ranks in a significant manner. But what I do like this year is Marquette's addition of Dawson Garcia, 
Really love that. I think he uh, might get a lot of flack for this, but I think he's a potential rookie of the year candidate. I think he's arguably the rookie oh. with the most talent in the league. I really do. Um, you know, you have guys like Posh, you have guys like Andre Jackson from UConn, but I think Dawson Garcia has got big, big shoes to fill. He will compliment Theo John really nicely, in my opinion. So um, Marquette's still got the talent. Marquette didn't really lose too many people. Obviously, you have the the monumental loss in Marcus Howard, which we're going to see how that plays out. But I think Marquette could be one of those teams, provided that they are COVID-free, of course, after what they've been going through in the last couple of weeks. So provided that they're ready to go and have practiced and have a good chemistry, I think you know we could see Marquette make a little noise that they, I don't think, in my opinion, were, were given the cred for this year. Well, well, they certainly have the right coach at the helm. Thanks, Jake. So now, you know, you brought up, Jake, you brought up Dawson Garcia. It's very funny because the Big East uh, kind of uh, awarded him as the preseason freshman of the year. Uh, so, you know, as you said, big shoes to fill with uh, with uh, uh, with Marcus Howard not being there, Shakar Adam no longer being there anymore. Now it's Jamal Kane. Now it's Dawson Garcia, Theo John, those guys, Kobe McCune. Uh, that really have to step up and see uh, what Marquette can do following their uh, their COVID nineteen bout. Rob Deluca, final thoughts for uh, for Jake Zimmer or any final questions on any team in the Big East? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Just to go back, we'll go to a team you're familiar with, Providence. I mean, look, I I'm actually not too surprised by their three spot. I think they're they definitely got the potential. I think that is a big reason just to the amazing coaching of Ed Cooley as well as I think, and this is kind of my question, uh, the importance of tra of transfer from UMass, Dwayne Pipkins. I think he was a phenomenal grab last season, and I think he's going to play a, uh, a huge part in Providence's success this season. Do you believe he's their go-to guy at this point with, their, with everyone they've lost and just everything going on this season, someone who is still going to be around, he's young, but he's also experienced. Do you see him as kind of like the go-to number one guy, game on the line, give him the ball? So let me clarify. So Pipkins, are, are you referring to him, his contributions last year? or? Yeah, yeah, when he first right. got to Providence, absolutely. Right, so Pipkins came in last year and he had big shoes to fill. Providence had no true point guard. Uh, as you know, we just talked about, David Duke was uh, not in a position where Ed Cooley wanted him to run the point last year. And he overperformed, to be honest with you. I think there were a lot of questions about um, – you know, his ability to succeed at the Big East level, obviously had a fine career at UMass. His redshirt senior year last year did a, a really phenomenal job. I think his talent was off the charts last year. He was a great shooter. He made clutch shots and he ran the floor the way he should have. Um, this year, I mean, they, they've got that hole to fill, right? So they, it's a very similar year where David Duke is probably going to be, you know, a mix of running point, uh, you know, with as being one of the more veteran leaders on that team. And, um, but there's no true one guard. I think there, uh, there's a lot of hype around Jared Bynum, who just transferred in this year, who, you know, uh, from St. Joe's over in Philly, he had 11.3 points per game just a couple of years ago. Uh, I think he's going to be a fine option for them well, or uh, as well, I should say. And then, you know, so you have Bynum, Duke, and A.J. Reeves, who's back for another year. Uh, Nate Watson will play the center position. And then Noah Horkler from North Florida seems to be the guy that's going to run uh, in the four spot this year. Horkler is a, a big guy. He's six eight. He's going to be a redshirt senior this year. He had 16 points per game at North Florida back in the 2018-19 season. So he's going to be a guy that you know Ed Cooley is going to rely on a lot. Cooley loves the way he can shoot. He loves his point or his uh, paint presence, I should say. And it's going to be another one of those years where they are going to have to rely on their depth too to carry them through the times that they can't. Uh, th those five guys can't be on the court. You look at a guy like Bryson Gooding with Syracuse. That's going to be a big addition. Ed Croswell from LaSalle. We don't know how he's going to be. He might plan to sit out this year too, but Providence is in another position to succeed. I think they're going to play great defense. It's a matter of those one or two guys. Maybe it'll be Bynum. Maybe it'll be Horkler that comes up big, can make big shots, play really good defense. I think that's the key for Providence. Jake, one final question for you while we have you here. It, we, we saw that there was a... Um, let's call it of sorts the biggie schedule that was released for the uh first month for the month of december uh everything obviously has been pushed up if you will december we're going to see conference games uh november 25th uh non-conference games start 
we're most likely going to see uh, in the range of at the bare minimum, and we've heard this as well, 13 games is the bare minimum that the NCAA wants teams to play. Again, want and can and could and should and would or whatever words, uh, that's a lot. Um, but we'll see. 13 games and in the range of 13 to 25. I know, Jake, I believe that those were the two numbers that we heard. I think that was from Mike Anderson as well. Um, we heard those two numbers. That's where the NCAA wants to have it at. Um, any game on the schedule that you see right now that is big and really that is intriguing come uh, post-COVID, well, not post-COVID time, but uh, the, new, the, the new Big East, if you will, or the new Big East season? I think this is going to sound very biased and it's going to tie in a lot of what we talked about today. But if your calendar is not circled for December 17th, UConn's coming to Providence. That's going to be two schools that were ranked, first of all, right next to each other in the coaches poll, three, three and four. And keep in mind, these are the coaches that are saying this. This is not the media. This is not AP. These are the coaches saying that Providence is the third best team in the Big East and UConn's going to be the fourth. That's one that you're going to have to keep your eyes on. I want to see how well James Booknight does against an elite defense. Um, and I really want to see how the Providence offense is shaking up at that point. They have a lot of good tests early. I think they're going to, uh, they're slated to play Indiana. They're slated to play TCU, both programs that historically have been pretty good. I think TCU is on the come up for sure. And we're going to have to see if the offense can turn it on against a, a UConn team that, you know, we'll have to see what they're like on defense as well. But I, I, I am very curious to see how James Booknight's going to do against a very rock solid defense in Providence. Yeah, they were talking about also uh, Dan Hurley um, was, I believe, talking about Jake. We heard that yes, uh, yesterday or two days ago that James Booknight's defense has really uh, gotten so much better uh, over the off season and uh, and really last year as well in the final year in the in the uh, AAC in the American Athletic Conference. So we'll have to see what that's all about come December December seventeenth, ladies and gentlemen. NCAA College Hoops Digest writer slash contributor slash whatever the hell you want to call it, Jake Zimmer, ladies and gentlemen. Jake, I really appreciate you coming on. And as we told Jaden Daly, there's so much more college basketball to talk about, and we'd love to have you back on again because it was such a fun time here this evening. It's coming. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it as always. Ian and Rob, a pleasure. Joey, thanks for having me. Of course. Thanks, you. Absolutely. Yep. We'll see you soon for sure. And uh, have a great night. So ladies and gentlemen, let's keep it moving here. We do have a few more minutes. Ian, Rob, college basketball is here, but we kind of forgot to touch upon something. And this is the most important thing right now. And Ian's turning his head, but this is one of his favorite sports, I think, is and it's football. And <laughs> we didn't really talk about that, but oh I, I, say it again. What's, what's what's really there to discuss? Oh, oh dear. <laughs> well, and really, we're not we're not going to go crazy with it. But there's one one question that we have to ask here, and for all of our viewers that have tuned in for football, because we still got another few minutes here. Um, most important talking point for week number eight, or recap from week number seven. Let's just sum it all up and come up with one thing. Start with the oh answer. man oh most <laughs> oh like where, where am i supposed to begin with this um i mean because i can't i really can't like touch on just anything when we only have a few minutes left here you, but you can. I, I think i think the biggest talking point that i really want to jump on maybe from from last week um Maybe this upcoming week, the 21 point spread between the Chiefs and the Jets. I'm, no, I'm kidding. But <laughs> um, I, th I think something that really has to be brought to light, and I'll and I'll be quick with it, is is what's going on with New England. Um, and and can and not even just Cam Newton. Uh, Julian Edelman's hurt now. Uh, this is the first time since actually 2000 uh, that um, they are currently having a losing season. Uh, they've got the Bills on tap this weekend. The Bills have a chance to move what, three, three and a half games, I believe it is, up on the Patriots at this point. I mean, you're really, at this point, could be sending the Patriots to two and five, putting them in a real deep hole that, in a very deep AFC. So it would be a very difficult hole to climb out of because the way you got to look at it right now is the AFC North has the Ravens and Steelers. You know, they're both getting there. So one of them's getting the wild card. Granted, seven teams are getting in this year. Um, you know, you, sh you uh, shift over to the, uh, I mean, that's really probably the deepest division right now. I mean, even the Browns are, are a discussion right now, but uh, 
Bills have a chance to do a lot of damage right now to New England. Um, Newton's last three games, one touchdown, six picks. It's it's not looking good right now. Um, if, if Bill Belichick wants to prove that uh, he can win without Brady, this needs to be the game where it's. Rob DeLuca, your final thought and uh, most important talking point for week eight or a recap of week seven. I would have to say the most important talking point would have to be last week, Dallas Cowboys versus football team. We saw Andy Dalton go down on what can only be described as a cheap shot. And the fact that the NFL did nothing about it is shameful. It's not, it's not public humiliation levels of shameful like the ML, our friends over at the MLB, but <laughs> it's certainly not a great look to see that Bostic got nothing for this because that was a clear and blatant headshot. It took out Andy Dalton and he's not playing this weekend. And, and not to, and now to get to an actual football analysis of it, Dallas is in big, big trouble here. They are, they, they were in trouble to begin with when Dak went down, but they, they, now they're going on a third string quarterback I mean, could he be the Lord and Savior? Maybe, but I mean, it just uh, it does not look good for Dallas. He a, Rob, he was a sixth round draft pick. That's oh, we all know the Ben Denucci. Oh dear, Ben Denucci. <laughs> Next Tom Brady, maybe, but probably not, because this is the NFC East where everything comes to die, and <laughs> everything is just in shambles. I don't know what's going to happen this weekend, other than Dallas just. Hang in there because you're right there with us, Giants and Eagles fans of this of this talk now. Where we are all sitting at beautiful sub 500 records with nowhere to look but way down. One of us is somehow going to end up hosting a playoff game this at the end of this season, and at this point, it is more than likely. Joey Jarzenka's Philadelphia Eagles. You know, it was very funny because um, I was debating on buying tickets for this upcoming week. And I'm a big germaphobe, right? And this is this, you know, you would think, you know, germaphobes going in the middle of a pandemic to a sporting event. But then I think to myself, 7,500 people in a 75,000. No, no, no. See, that's the thing. 7,500 people, that includes players, that includes the guys in the field, that includes everything. So in terms of fans, that's about 5,200 in a in a 70,000 seat building. Right. And and the way that it's all spread out, I was thinking, I was like, you know what? If I wear my mask, if I have it taped to my mouth shut, I think we'll be okay. But tickets were too expensive because Eagles fans- It's, right. it's bad. To- I've looked. Oh, 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 I was going to ask you, what, what happens if someone comes standing up next to you at a urinal? What are you going to do? Listen, let me tell you something. I am I'm going to empty the water bottle. I'm going to empty the water bottle, and we're going to do it that way if all those- oh. Okay. Uh, All right. Can I just say how thankful I am that we ran out of time on this show? That we have, we'll have a whole new football week to to cover next week. And the fact I don't have to talk to Rob DeLuca and argue with him about a kicker from Tennessee. Oh. Oh, (laughs) Okay. That's pretty good. You weren't going to argue up. Oh, I think we're getting there. I think we were. What were we? He won. He won him three games. He lost him one. Whatever. The, the team to watch for uh, is the San Francisco 49ers. Jeff Wilson, uh, Jeff Wilson Jr., um, he had a high ankle sprain after scoring touchdown number three. Uh, in 17, in, uh, he had 17 carries, 112 yards. He averaged 6.6 yards, uh, yards per rush and three touchdowns. Um, and really, right now, I think the coolest thing, too, guys, is, is that Jimmy, G, uh, Jimmy Garoppolo became the second quarterback to defeat Bill Belichick other than Drew Bledsoe, um, and he was entering Bill Belichick, that was, 7-1 and one entering that game. We were talking about San Francisco and Seattle, guys. Um, I think the biggest thing here is, is that um, there was some you know ups and downs where the injuries have mounted for San Francisco, and now they're slowly beginning to get a little bit better, and I don't want to say that the 33-6 romping of New England in Foxborough, mind you, uh, shows their true colors, but I think against Seattle's porous defense, similar to Swiss cheese, actually, um, it, it is will be a telling sign to see if they can compete with 
Seattle, and also with the LA Rams. Let's not forget also, how about the Arizona Cardinals as well? The NFC West has got to be the best division in all of football, hands oh, down, man. and it's not close. You know who's a close second? The AFC North. We'll get to that next week. So that is going to be uh, my team to look out for. Um, and again, San Francisco has a lot to prove this upcoming week. And I think it's not only America's game of the week on television, but it's also one of the best games on the entire week eight schedule. That's what I think, um, you know, aside from Pittsburgh and Baltimore. Uh, but San Francisco, Seattle is, uh, is definitely up there. Guys, any closing thoughts before we head to the credits? I just want to know how 49ers Seahawks wasn't, you know, somehow Bucks Giants can't get flexed to a Monday 9 a.m. game in London and how they can't move 49ers Seahawks to Sunday and then somehow move Cowboys Eagles to maybe 11 a.m. in London. I just want to try find a better and try and find two better games for, oh. for, for primetime Sunday night and Monday night because that's atrocious. This is going to be awful. <laughs> I mean, I'm looking at the Giants. But uh, left guard, he has COVID. Yeah. Granted, it might only help because he's not that good, but neither is anybody else. Like I said, I'm staying off another 30 minute Giants conversation. We'll leave it at that. Rob DeLuca, any final thoughts before we get to the credits? No, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> he's just done. He's just done. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's been a fun episode number 39 and, uh, wow, 39 episodes. Really? That's crazy. What does Adam Gase think about it? Oh, <laughs> he he's really he, 39. We're 39 episodes in next week is episode number 40. That can only mean we have to make it special. Really? Yeah, we, yeah that, that, that's true. It is really amazing stuff. Uh, something else that we want to get to as well. Um, you know, on on Monday evening, we start a new trend. And uh, this is something pretty big, guys, because Ian Schreier knows it all about this because he is the new host of this. So I think, I think we have to let him say the preview <laughs> of his new show, which also, well, it's not even his new show. It's our show now that is also episode number 40. Well, like Joey said, I'm going to be uh, very humble to be sitting in the chair that's usually uh, occupied by him on the primetime rundown Zoom interview series. But this Monday, November 2nd, 8 p.m., we're branching out into a new segment of the interview series where we will be focusing on an industry that I obviously have a lot of love for. And so does Joey, the athletic communications industry. And we'll be starting with uh, the Associate Director of Athletics for Communications at uh, nearby Hofstra University, Stephen Gorchov. He's been at Hofstra for just over 30 years. Uh, I kind of consider him more or less the godfather of uh, Long Island SIDs. And since our footprint's on Long Island, uh, I, I don't think there was a better way to start. So I'm really looking forward to Monday night. Yeah, it's going to be tons of fun. 8 p.m. right here on the Eastern Observer, also Channel 198 on Zingo Television, I-95 Sports Network, and can also be seen on Channel 199 on Blackjack TV as well. Uh, moving forward, ladies and gentlemen, as well, let's not forget our good friends at the Essential Wrestling Podcast. Episode number 26 comes your way on Tuesday night, election night, November 3rd at 6 p.m., presented to you by Pro Wrestling Pick. Them. All can be seen right here on the Eastern Observer. The show's graphics are presented to you by Minutes to Bell Time as well. It can be seen here on the Eastern Observer, I-95 Sports Network on Zingo Television Channel 198 as well. Also, we, we don't have a graphic for it, uh, which is uh, which is actually in, in large part my fault. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not my fault because I've been building graphics and, and pulling video for all of us here this, this evening, but uh, we continue our Scouts Minute and, uh, and our New York Professional Scouts Association relationship and our little crossover series called the Scouts Minute. Tomorrow, we will be uh, highlighting the stellar career of amateur scouting director for the Arizona Diamondbacks, Steve Connolly, formerly with the Toronto Blue Jays under the Alex Anthopoulos tree. He was the one to sign former infielder Mike Aviles. So we'll get to uh, hear more about uh, the journey through Major League Baseball for Queens-born native and also LIU Brooklyn Blackbird uh, former, uh, catcher for, uh, for, uh, for the Blackbirds, Steve Connolly. So ladies and gentlemen, for one final time, we really appreciate you joining us here. And also special thanks to our good friend, Tyler Adele, as well as the daily dose of hoops, 
uh, founder and head writer, Jaden Daly, as well as NCAA College Hoops Digest writer and contributor. And as we said earlier, whatever the hell else he wants to be, co- be called as, uh, Jake Zimmer. So we really appreciate those guys coming on. Ian and Rob, we'll see you next week. Ian, we'll see you on Monday as well for the new show, or for episode number 40 of the interview series. Ladies and gentlemen, one final time, I'm Joey Jarzinka, and for all of us at the Blackjack Media Group, we'll see you next time.